Hey cunts, don't forget to click the subscribe button. Thank you, please be seated. Um, thank you very much for the applause. The, um, uh, normally, um, we get a tour from around the universities, and I was just telling the young man, James Goins, who's a mentee, he's been to the Castle Seminar, who's a student here, that uh, when we were touring around the University of Florida, it was with a cute blonde like this and with short pants. And instead, I get a tall, skinny black kid. <laughs> I mean, um, but the Florida talk wound up ending badly. If you saw me on YouTube, uh, going to choke the kid who uh, questioned my uh, abilities or my authority. But I I'm very happy to be here. And it's um, the normally I start by uh, good evening, la uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Uh, and I call you all kids during the talk because I'm either old enough to be your father or grandfather for most of you. There's a few exceptions. I see a few old shits in the audience, so uh, I'm not old enough, perhaps. Um, but um, if you like me, at the end of this talk, I did something fucking wrong. James said it not exactly as I would say it. You're here because you're living, for the most part, quiet lives of desperation. People come to me out of inspiration and desperation. Even though 1% thinks you're inspired, you're not. You're desperate. And we're going to talk about success leaves clues. Bad things that you've been uh, led to believe that are accurate or correct by your parents. Bad things by religion, namaste. I'm into namaste now since we were just in Kathmandu and we were uh, 18,000 feet plus on uh, Mount Everest. Um, but most of what you've heard so far is wrong. Now, this is not the kind of bar stool I had in mind, but I have been hit in one of these broken over my back before. We have a Hall of Fame mentee who's worth a few hundred million dollars who he wants to be involved in a barroom brawl before he dies. He wants somebody to hit him with a bar stool. Now, this kid weighs about 115 pounds. The likelihood of him lasting through a, a bar fight is zero. But he has a fantasy, because a lot of times when you get a lot of money, you fantasize. You also fantasize when you have no money. Most of you in this audience are closer to the no money end of the continuum than the rich end of the continuum. Now, I know probably more about Benjamin Franklin than I need to know, because I did my homework. He died at 84, a sick, fat old man. But 84 back in those days was pretty damn old. And having just turned 74 myself, I can appreciate that. Not the sick, old, fat part, but the old part. He is known for inventing bifocals, electricity, to name a couple. He was the first president, the sixth president of Pennsylvania, the state. They had presidents back then. He was the founder of this school in 1840 at age 34. At age 42, he retired from life. He had made all the money he thought was necessary. Now, I can relate to that, but I did it at 39. So I'm a couple years ahead of him. But he had accumulated wealth and property, uh, which we would call now real estate, and amongst a number of other things. Um, now, one of the things he invented was a decatheter. Now, you young kids don't even know what the hell a decatheter is. But it's a pipe you put in your penis, if you're a man, to allow yourself to pee. He invented the flexible decatheter. Now ask yourself why. Why? Why do you need a decatheter? Except for gonorrhea, syphilis, etc. Enlarged prostate. And how do you get an enlarged prostate? Well, not having resigned myself to the decatheter, but I'm told from my research, it wasn't just an enlarged prostate. It was mostly because he was a ladies' man. And for those of you that know, he got more ass than a, than a toilet seat at a bus station. That means getting your willy wet, guys. Do we, do, do the kids still understand that concept, getting your willy wet. Now, this is your beautiful school. 
although James wasn't a cute black girl, a cute white girl with a short skirt, he did a very good job in taking us around. And uh, you have a wonderful campus. Arguably, you were the first university in America that called yourself a university. There's a little argument about that, but I, I believe, since I'm here, I'll, I'll believe that Penn is the first university. And you had a lot of firsts. Now, your alumni, a lot of distinguished guys. Obviously, you know that the current president graduated here. The sixth president of the United States uh, graduated from here. But the most famous alumni that I found was Doc Holliday of wider uh, fame. Where is Doc Holliday? Come on, Doc. Ah, there he is. Doc Holliday graduated from your dental school. A murderer, gunslinger, and his picture's up there right with President Trump. His picture's up there right with Mr. Huntsman, who donated a lot of money here, and a lot of buildings are named after him. But I always knew, at least from reading and from the movies, that he was an educated man. He spoke in Latin. That doesn't make him educated, but in 1860, 70, if you spoke in Latin, I guess you were educated. Most of you can't read or write Latin in this room, myself included. It's what they consider a dead language. And then, of course, only I can turn it off like that. And, of course, Elon the Musk, probably the most famous current day uh, graduate of this fine university. Now, I went to a school that you got to explain about. Even though I'm the most successful alumni in the history of the school, and I've created more wealth than the entire alumni since the school began, I am persona non grata at my university. I am persona non grata. Because 20, 20 some years ago, I said it's a school you got to explain about. You go to, a, for those of you that have went to school here, and for those of you that attended, are currently attending, you never have to explain Explain about Penn. You owe an obligation, not just to the university, but to humanity and yourself. And I want you to remember, every slide that goes from this place forward, how does this apply to me, and how do I take action? How does this apply to me, and how do I take action? I have said, more times than I can count, that in four words, I developed the whole theory of life that would normally take at least one book, if not volumes. Just fucking do it. Don't overanalyze. Don't analyze at all. Follow your gut. Follow your dream. Follow your passion. I took the Nike, just do it, and added the uh, F word. And it has stood me in good stead and has got me a long, long ways. And yes, my wife and I live in a 15th century storybook castle. And yes, we have butlers that were at Buckingham Palace. And yes, we have ghosts. And yes, uh, we live differently than most people in this room, probably all of you in this room. Yet there's something about me that you either love me or hate me. The ones that hate me is they're shooting the messenger. Notwithstanding, my message is 99% accurate. I'm not going to talk about climate change here. But there have been 11 groups that have visited both South Poles since 1913 when Amundsen discovered the South Pole. 11 groups, 10 of which are dead. One of which, half of it is standing on this stage, and the other half is the pretty blonde in the front row. Yet people pontificate about climate change that has been around for millions of years. But I didn't come here to talk about climate change although it's one of my favorite topics. And I've been struck off to other Ivy League campuses because of my views on climate change. So I'm not going to pontificate about climate change, but I would, I would be uh, remiss if I didn't mention it at this fine university. Now, I hate to use Harvard numbers, but this is a recent study that's published by Harvard University. Or just, we'll just call it a well-known university. We won't say it's Harvard. I should have struck off the, the word Harvard. Now, our analysis uncovered the most common types of pandas, meaning excuses, why their careers are stuck or you're not advancing in your life as fast as you want or in your goals. First, 36% of the pandas related to the executive presence. In other words, your lack of executive presence. 
You only have two times to make a first impression. One, when I see you, what you look like. The second time, when you open your big mouth or small mouth. Those are the only two times. After that, you have to perform. For those of you that are Penn students, for those of you that have gone to prestigious schools like this fine university, that university degree gets you in the door. Now, James Gowen is one of my success stories. I met him as a skinny airman in the United States Air Force about almost five years ago at Hickam, Air Bay, or Hickam Field in uh, Hawaii. My wife and I were there to visit our 98-year-old aunt who was getting ready to celebrate her 100th birthday. She started planning her 100th birthday. And unfortunately, as soon as she started planning her 100th birthday, she died. Success leaves clues. When you get around to a major birthday, don't plan it until it's right upon you. I used to put everything at the age of 80. I was going to do this by the time I ate. Now I'm 74 since I'm almost going to be 80. Now it's 90. I pushed it off. Now, the next excuse they use is 28% related to the communication style or the lack thereof. Leadership, remember, is me getting you to do what I want you to do when I want you to do it, not when you get up off your dead ass to do it. The third reason they use is 29% related to peer level relationships. You are who you hang around with. You are judged by who you hang around. Machiavelli said, show me you're judged by the five people that you surround yourself with. Now, I asked this question at university, and I'm sure I'm going to get about the same answer. If you're the average of the five people that you hang with, that you fucking chill with, how would you be judged? How many in this room have children? How many in this room would like your children to grow up and be like your parents? Not one fucking hand. How many in this room would like your children to grow up and be like you? Not one fucking hand. Oh, we had a half a hand. Okay, okay. Okay, we got one and a half hands. Guys, gals, kids. We are a product of our social and economic milieus. We are a product of our parents and their parents. Now, the first seven years of life uh, is when seven, eight years of life, self-esteem is built. Who are you around the first seven, eight years of life? A mom, maybe a dad, right? Maybe one grandparent, maybe an older brother or sister. Now, what in God's name do they know anything about raising high-performance people? Zippo, zero. Nothing. Now, we're going to show some examples of kids that are programmed for success. Most people that come from poverty-stricken backgrounds are told their key out of the body, out of the ghetto, is education. We've heard that story, OK? I'm here to tell you it's not. Not just because I went to a school you got to explain about. But even if I'd come to this fine university, this is one of the universities that wouldn't accept me when I came back from the military. I got a list of schools that wouldn't accept me. I just got a, just a, 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 not even a rejection letter. I got a letter uh, next. But they made the right decision because they were basing their admitment or potential admitment on what I had accumulated in education, what I had done with my life before, which was pretty close to nothing. Now, it's true, I've been arrested five times. I told my, by the way, the, the, the gentleman and the uh, lovely woman in red in the front are my kid brother and his wife, who this is uh, perhaps the first time that um, he's seen me speak in person. Uh, but I told him, you may hear some things about the family that uh, are family secrets. And because you can't say families without saying lies. Not th now, this is a smart group, come on. Families. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. OK. Uh, and uh, the last reason, uh, 29 related to the peer level relationships. In other words, you are who you hang around with. And the remaining 7% included excessive optimism and perfection. I didn't hang around with those people. My people that I spent lots of time with weren't optimists or perfectionists for sure. But you may fall into one of those categories. But all these categories now are telling us that recent studies say that 8 out of 10 workers admitted crying at work with almost half of those saying bosses or colleagues had driven to them to tears. 
About 14% of the workers say they cry at least once a week and sometimes every day. Crying at work can be a sign of something wrong, really. <laughs> Holy shit. I'm surprised this didn't come out of Yale or Princeton, you know? Uh, uh, geniuses, right? It came out of Harvard. Came out of Harvard. No, I don't know if it came out of Harvard. But the point is that when I was growing up, the only time I cried is when my dad beat me, the nuns beat me, or the priest beat me. I tried to not cry when my mom beat me. It wasn't a manly thing to do. Now people cry at work. During this talk, although I'm not toning it down, we've had people pass out. We've had people piss their pants. We've had people shit their pants. Of course, a high and lofty group like this, I'm sure none of those things will happen. Right, old timer? Now you look like a college professor. You look like one. I'm not saying you are one, but you look like one. You, oh, he says, thank you. Okay. We'll see if he thanks me later. Okay. <laughs> now, these kind of statistics didn't exist when I was growing up. They didn't exist. Now, people commit suicide because they get unliked on Facebook. That is so far beyond my comprehension. Now, I know it's a new world, but is it a better world? When I was growing up, sticks and stones can break your bones, Dan, but words can never hurt you. Of course, nobody uses that anymore. And in fact, in the UK, they have commercials saying that it's a new time, and it's a, it's a new way of life. It's a new new, and it's not sticks and stones that you have to worry about, but it's words. Now, when I was a child, when you had a disagreement, you just take, go, after school, go out in the parking lot, and you punch it out. And whoever was not on the ground won the argument. Now, some people say I'm savage. Some people say I'm a bully. Both things are true. But I tell the truth. And I've created tens of millions with monkeys, meatheads just like you. So don't shoot the messenger. Listen to the message very carefully. The alumni that we uh, showed a few slides ago all shared one thing in common, focus. The fact that it's an Asian person in this slide is just coincidental because I just uh, spoke at uh, Dan Locke, one of my very successful mentees, uh, uh, Black Tie Gala in Vancouver a few days ago. And the, uh, most of the audience is Asian. Uh, and, uh, the, uh, and Dan uh, Locke uh, came to me in 2003, 21 years old, and now lives in a $25 million house. And he uh, drives around uh, cars almost as expensive as mine. Uh, and he is a, uh, on uh, Fox News, CNN, etc., as an expert in digital marketing. Um, um, based on the success he's had, which is a big clue, I have to admit, which I don't know much about digital marketing, he has to be good at it because he's not in jail, he's never been arrested, he's not indicted, and he's made a lot of money. Now, good things come to those who go out and fucking earn it. Now, the days of you working 40 years for AT&T, Prudential, etc., and getting a gold watch, not like this gold watch, but a gold watch and a retiring are dead. Now, I asked the schools, and I'm going to ask you, how many classes have you had in selling a business? OK, I thought you were raising your hand. OK. How many classes have you had in buying a business? How many classes, excluding the veterans? By the way, I thank all the veterans for your service. Excluding the vets. How many classes have you had in leadership? Ah, we got three hands. We got an old git, a woman next to him, a couple, OK. Four people out of 300. <sighs> Buying and selling the business, unless you're going to go to work for AT&T or IBM, et cetera, uh, are uh, paramount. The class or the group or the uh, lecture that I give the university students normally is uh, risk, success, risk, reward, not. Meaning to be successful, you're not taught what to go out and do to be successful because you're basically groomed to go work for somebody. During my tour today, when I saw the Huntsman building and this building, that building, these guys 
and I, there may have been gals there, but I don't remember the names, all built fortunes, creating jobs for people. But it was their business. It wasn't the employee's business. It was their fortune. It wasn't your fortune. Now you're relegated to a 401k. Some of the big firms still have pension plans. Some, but most put back the investment onus on you. So a slide that's coming up in a few seconds when I tell you that 50% of you will run out of money before you run out of time. 50% of this audience will not have enough money to retire on. Based on statistics through 2018. Unless you do, about, do something about it now. And we're going to give you, not tips, not hints, but some success clues based on other people's success so you don't die broke. Now, my wife and I have been blessed to go to some some of the most beautiful places on the planet. We've been to the North and South Pole, as I alluded to a little earlier. I now call us bipolar, both poles bipolar. My wife, who is a professional chartered accountant from Britain, X, E, and Y, doesn't like that example. Okay? My wife and I argue about who was poor, myself or her. Uh, we've decided because, for marital reasons, she was more poor than I was. Okay? Not necessarily based on facts. Although she was raised in a caravan, a caravan is a mobile home that's about from here to here. You look stunned, young man. Family of four in a, in a little house that big in about this square. So based on that, I never lived in a mobile home. Um, the, uh, and I, although the first house that my father built after World War II was only uh, 880 f square feet, which seems to me a little small. Um, we're going to, just for the time being, going to say that my wife was poor. But we've been to some lovely places. Um, and we just returned from Kathmandu, where I had the privilege of speaking at an engineering university. Uh, and I told the kids, audience probably as big as this, that um, my secret to their success is leave Nepal because you will not be able to break the circle of poverty. But I can say that about almost any third, fourth world country. I can't say that about Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Do you know why they call it Philadelphia, Philadelphia the city of brotherly love? Because there is no fucking love here. Don't you get it? But I had a cheese. What's that thing I had today to eat? Yes. I mean, that thing had 5,000 calories if it had one. <laughs> but it was delicious. I also had a glass of wine with it, which I don't normally drink during the day, but I, it, it just deserved a glass of red wine. It deserved a glass of red wine. Now, Nepal is not Shangri-La. Although I must admit, and I've told people in uh, podcast interviews, I did feel a little different. Now, Sally says I felt different because we were at 18,000 feet, Mount Everest, the first bank, uh, above the base camp, it was a uh, lack of oxygen. But I did feel different. And for about 10 days, two weeks, I might have been kinder and more gentle. But that's worn off. I'm back to my normal self. And as our daughter would say, who went to uh, Boston University, undergrad, she'd say, Daddy treats everybody the same. He, he treats them like shit. Uh, and people ask me, why am I so harsh? Because it works. And I'm at a green school here, liberal as shit. I mean, but guys, gals, fear works. Savageness works in business. I'm embarrassed to say. But why do you continue it, Dan? Because it works. And I've created $775 billion with shit brains just like you. Why would I change that system? Why? I give all my product away free. I give countless free talks like this. Tough love works. If love worked and religion worked, there'd be nobody in this room. Who are the most religious individuals on the planet? The poorest. 
I could give a whole week lecture on the Catholic Church. And I'm a Catholic altar boy. They've got their hands so far up my ass. I'm surprised you don't see the Pope's ring coming out of my mouth. I wanted to be a priest. 85% of the money Sally and I give is to the Catholic Church or subsidiaries of the Catholic Church. We support stuff in Sri Lanka. We support stuff in Rwanda. We support stuff in uh, the Philippines. We support all Catholic Church related. And I put my money on St. Teresa when the bitch was just Mother Teresa. And she's been the fastest to become a saint in the church's history, I believe. The church, I have 240 nuns praying for myself and my family every single day. 25 priests, 40 brothers. They say I'm on a rocket ship to heaven. And for those of you who don't know the history of St. Teresa, she was a tough bitch, ruthless, savage. And if she was made sainthood in the shortest time in history, I'm going to pass Elon and Jeff on the way to Mars like they were standing still. Now, a sidebar. Why does Jeff and why does Elon, which I, I know neither, why does Richard Branson, who I do know, especially Jeff and Elon, why do they want to go to Mars? I'm, this isn't a question. It's a comment. They want to go to Mars because we're through as a species. Elon makes it sound, an alumni here, he makes it sound better by saying, uh, we want to be a two-planet species, I think he says, or words to that effect. But what he's really thinking is because we fucked it up. And it's not just climate change. It's not just that we're using more resources, blah, 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 blah. I mean, we made a lot of mistakes as a species. And I'm one of the people, individuals, maybe the only, the only one that will articulate it, it's irreversible. I don't care what happens to the planet the day after I die. And contrary to what you think, all the rich guys think exactly like I do, but they're trying to paint their legacy. It's like an ex-president trying to get money for his library and he who writes the history makes it. Now, I know these guys. You don't. I've talked to these guys. You haven't. What are you smoking? If it's not um, habit forming, give me some. I'd like to be in the same uh, illusion as you're living in. Don't you see it? I do. I was on a podcast a couple days ago, a rapper podcast that has four or five million followers. Why does a rapper podcast want to talk to me? And he asked me about some of the billionaires that I know off camera. And he said, even if he said that on camera, we would, we'd cut it out. Do you think Elon or Steve Jobs or um, Henry Ford the first or Rockefeller or Carnegie really gave a shit what you thought or thought then or think now? No. Now, I've met five presidents, five secretaries of state, more senators, ambassadors than I can, you know, wipe my butt with. They are different off camera. Every once in a while, you catch one of them where he thinks he's off camera and he's on camera, on mic, and they sound just like you, don't they? I'll never forget when Joe Biden, because Joe Biden's big news now, because Joe, um, anyway, I don't want to say anything bad about it. Joe tells Obama, boy, this is a big fucking deal on camera, and it's a live mic. That's how they talk. You have no idea how they think. You have no idea. And by the way, I've met all five presidents, my five presidents, none of them in the White House. Full disclosure, I knew President Trump in another lifetime. We haven't talked in 25 years. Of course, now that I'm so outrageous, he's probably never going to talk to me again. Although, and I don't agree with everything. I didn't come here to promote President Trump. But I don't agree with a lot of stuff he says. Unless you're crazy, you can't agree with a lot of the stuff he says. I understand that. But the financial world will never be the same. Germany, South America, Bulgaria, finance will never be the same. Never, ever. So we have him to thank for that. And I'm still waiting to go to this place that may or may not exist. 
And more recently, I've been called the trillion dollar man, even though I've only created 775 billion, because it's pretty much agreed I will hit a trillion with you guys. Now, if Wharton, as good as you think you are, with all the prestige, all the goddamn manpower, out of this room alone, I had to go over a trillion. I put that on you as a challenge. University of Pennsylvania, founded by Benjamin Franklin, went to the second grade in 1740, that discovered the flexible decatheter, which I hope I never have to use. <laughs> I'm the only individual that has created millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions, tens of billions, and hundreds of billions with kids like you. Now, some of my multi-billionaires would probably disagree with me, Dan. They never went to school, never got out of high school, et cetera, et cetera. But it, does, it doesn't take anything special. You don't have to donate $50 million to have a, a building named after you to create this money. And I pretty much proved it. When I went into the business in May 1993, <coughs> I gave my first seminar, I wanted to change what was then called personal development financial coaching. Now, I'm going to tell you a little secret about personal development. In 1956 or 57, thereabouts, um, a W. Clement Stone, famous insurance magnate of the day, went to Napoleon Hill, who was bankrupt at the time, and he said, I, I, he came up with Think and Grow Rich, and there's a whole other theory whether they ever met at Carnegie, or whatever, I'm leaving that aside. And he says, I've got to come up with a sales gimmick for my insurance salesman. At that time, he had 10,000 insurance salesmen. We need to give him something. What do we call it? But we, well, you don't want to measure it because we don't want you to feel bad. We don't want you to be depressed or whatever. And so it's arguable who came up with it, either Robert Clement Stone or um, Napoleon Hill. Personal development! You can't measure fucking personal development! And the personal development industry was born. Now, I talked to W. Clement Stone myself in this, this ear because I tried to uh, see him for dinner several times in Chicago. His house burned down, unfortunately, about 2001, and he died shortly after. It broke his heart. He was, I think, 101 or 102. So the thing in this room, or the things that you've read, podcasts, etc., based on personal development, was started by an insurance salesman. I have nothing against insurance. I sold insurance door to door myself. And a defrocked Napoleon Hill. Yet almost everybody in this room has been engaged in one form of personal development or another. So were you part of the fraud? Did you make the fraud self-fulfilling? You answer it yourself. Now, my 74th birthday was August 10th, a few weeks ago. And this is the last part of my trip that my wife gave me for my birthday. Now, speaking at Penn, I don't know if you call that a gift, but anyway. Um, and the first part of it was um, uh, the um, uh, Kathmandu, Nepal. But on August the 6th and August the 9th in 1945, they dropped an atomic bomb. One on Hiroshima, one on Nagasaki. That's the Hiroshima one, this is the Nagasaki. One day later, I was born, 1945. There used to be a theory, which isn't talked about anymore. You've seen the movie Godzilla, and how Godzilla was formed from the atomic explosions in the Polynesian Islands. Well, for those of you that are engineers, you realize we're all energy, in one form or another. We're all energy. And if you're a Hindu or a, a, Buddha, a, a person who believes in Buddha, it even transcends that. Well, the world was never the same after they dropped those two bombs. And I was born. Because I am different. There is nobody even remotely like me. Am I a product like Godzilla? Well, I've been, worse, I've call, I've been called a lot worse than Godzilla, believe me. I have, I have three million pores in my body. Most of you have three million pores. And I've been fucked in every one of them twice. Every one of them at least twice. 
sometimes three times. So I am different. As our children used to say when they were growing up, Daddy, you're not like the other daddies. We, I was, uh, there was a, a little debutante thing that our daughter went to, and uh, the auctioneer uh, uh, wasn't getting the money out of the people for auctioning things like he should. Black guy function, I jumped up on the stage, and I, I raised 10 times more money than anybody had ever raised in the history of that school. You got your, the wife, give me a ch fucking checkbook right now. Write five grand on it. Now, why do I get away with this outrageous shit? Why? Other than I'm 99.99% accurate and truthful. I do exaggerate, like the president does. I say I bench pressed 400 pounds. I only bench pressed 395. They didn't put the curl, uh, the, 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 what do you call it, on the end. I do say that the uh, multi-billionaires that I created are just like you meatheads, but they're not really. They're laser beam focused, and they would rather die than be poor. You can't say that about most audiences. Most people that come to talk to me, even though they're desperate, they don't want to get out of their comfort zone. They don't want to get out of their comfort zone because you didn't see your parents get out of your comfort zone. I just asked you, would you like your kids to be like your parents? Why doesn't anybody else talk like this? Because they're trying to sell you something. I'm not trying to sell you a goddamn thing. There's no books in the back of the room. All my product's free on my website. And if they tell you you're a fucking moron, you won't buy their shit. I've been saying this 26 years, more or less. It's a little more refined now. In the 90s, I used to hit people at my talks. Choke them. Just imagine, if I was still doing that, everybody's got an iPhone. Everybody, right? Or almost everybody. Well, not, some people have two or three, right? I'd be on the 6 o'clock news every goddamn day. Now, QLA gives you the ch uh, choice to die financially standing like a man or a woman or continue and die on your financial knees living quiet lives of desperation as your parents do or did. If you don't want your kids to be like your parents, it's not because the, the, your parents left you a billion dollars, is it? This stuff is matter of fact. It's like two plus two equals four. I told you about running out of money. I got ahead of myself. Now, this is not how my wife and I, uh, is, where's the water, please? Uh, this is not how Sally and I dress every day. Heard that scream. Um, but um, we do dress. And as I said earlier, we do have uh, butlers that serve in Buckingham Palace and that kind of thing. And, but we don't even look at it that way. When kids come to the castle, 55,000 square feet, 156 acres, with our own golf course. We don't look at it that way. It's just our house. When our kids are there, they don't look at it anything special either. When the kids drop, walk by our cars, and we have some expensive cars, um, we don't look at it that way. Although when we have other guests there, they want to take a picture next to the, the Rolls, just like the Queen's Rolls, or the Bentley, or the DB7, or the, the Ferrari. Uh, we've given the Cobra to our youngest son, so we don't have the Cobra sitting out there anymore. You see Cobra. But this has become our comfort zone now. And one of the reasons I decided to start speaking pro bono several years ago is to get out of my comfort zone. It also gives me a thumb on the pulse of what you kids are thinking. And a lot of the stuff you're thinking isn't accurate. It sounds, it sounds okay when talking heads are doing it on CNN or CNBC or even Fox. But it's not. And the reason why you listen to it or believe it is because you have no other source of information. You have no other source of information. Now, we've grown um, like crazy in the last four and a half years since social media discovered me through Brian Rose and London Reel. I, like Bill Gates about the internet, thought social media was horseshit. It was a passing fancy. How could anybody with half a brain I was so wrong, it's just, it's incredible. I was, uh, you know, one of the, I just got dead wrong, 100% wrong. Uh, but since then, I've been reborn. 
uh, and um, I have a lot of interest in what I have to say. And we have a lot of people that are going out and pulling the trigger. But you've never related taking action, immediate action, without spreadsheeting. I don't think anybody in this room, other than some of my mentees, has ever made a decision they did not spreadsheet. Now, the alleged inventor of pros and cons was uh, Benjamin Franklin. Now, whether that's true or not, if it's on Wikipedia, it must be true. Okay? And guess what? What's on Wikipedia, there's a lot of stuff that's not true. Now, my uh, section on Wikipedia is hardly anything. We have people that are trying to make sure that I, I die or go out of business, and so every time somebody posts something that's truthful about me, And uh, for those of you, uh, I'm happy for you to put stuff on Wikipedia as long as it's, it's truthful. Um, but you and I, myself included, I have a whole staff now that's on social media keeping me up to date. I would have never thought I'd ever do that. I would have never thought I'd ever do that. For more than 25 years, I've been the Leonides of financial, financial coaching. That's me. where measurable expectations are demanded. The difference between what I coach, teach, mentor, whatever, is I demand you to do it, or I throw you out. I demand. I keep you to a timetable for every hour that you're awake. Every fucking hour. Most of you in this room waste at least 60% of your days. At least. Some of you waste 80%. Some of you waste 90%. Nobody holds you accountable. Nobody. I hear that even universities don't hold people accountable now. They've got wishy-washy policies. Well, you can come to class or not come to class, cha-cha-cha. You can turn in the paper or not turn in the paper, cha-cha-cha. I taught honors at the university. I got explained about 1994, 1995. We had 300, 330 people participating in a contest to be in my honors class. First day of class, 317 people. End of the year, 13 people. 300 went bye-bye. Because you had to come to class. I had pop quizzes. I had homework. I had three papers. If I thought the kids were snowflakes in 1994 and 1995, those were superheroes compared to today. Just imagine, pop quizzes, three papers, and I forgot the project. But the 13 that gra graduated and the 13 that uh, wound up at the end, last man standing, all thought they were going to get A's. Were they surprised? Because they, they, they made it through the gauntlet. Uh, we gave one A and the rest B's. One A and the rest B's. And I've been told in, in later years, if I'd known that, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have stayed the class. I would have gotten out. Now, today I'm not going to teach you, but lead you uh, based on my own 50 years of experience coaching and mentoring kids to be more than they ever dreamt they could be, super high performance in anything. The difference between the high performance people that I've had the privilege of being around, one of the things the, uh, uh, the, uh, the pod guy asked me, how many billionaires have I made? And I said, 25, 28, more or less. But some of them 30 billion, some 50 billion. 20. And he said, uh, how many billionaires do you know? other than the ones that you help coach. And I said, eight, nine, something like that. And he said, uh, well, what's, what's the common trait or the, the tip or whatever the, the, the new phrase is? They were all fucking focused. I mean, it's, uh, some, most of them had OCD, compulsive disorder, which I suffer from. But if you've got it, as you get older, it, it, wears, it wears down. So my ADHD and OCD have worn down over the last 50 years. 
But when I was going to school, as I was discussing with my kid brother earlier tonight, um, the, uh, I got in a lot of trouble. I tried to kill my teacher in the sixth grade by dropping an aquarium, which is more or less famous now, on his head. And if he hadn't moved six or eight inches to one side, it hit him in the shoulder, and his shoulder went down to here. Uh, I'd be, he would have died, and I would, you know, this, there would be no story left. But they used to put me in the corner. They used to stand kids in the corner in the old days. With, with me, I had a dunce cap. Just imagine doing this shit today. And I'm in the corner, and if I turn too many times, then they took the dunce cap off me, and they put me in the closet. Until one of my parents picked me up. I'd be in there three, four, five hours. I'd piss myself, shit myself. They wouldn't let me out. Just imagine if that had happened to you. But our dad taught us it's not what happens to you in life, it's how you interpret what happens to you in life. So I was just trying to think of positive thoughts as best I could as a little kid. Well, I guess the shit rolling down the inside of my leg must be a good thing. You know, I, I, somewhere it's going to, you know, as it turned out when I got in the military, it was a good thing, you know. Um, but we were taught it's not what happens to you. It's how you interpret it. We went through several spa safe spaces here on campus. Is, th is that what you call them, James? Safe? Like yeah, okay. And um, it's not the first campus I've been on in safe spaces. And, um, but this is a very, uh, very difficult concept for me to absorb. It certainly doesn't resonate with me, just as, you know, 14% or whatever, people cry at work. I don't get that. I just don't bloody get it. But I know it's true. We were at uh, one of the leading universities in Poland a couple years ago, and I, I said, well, it's awful quiet on this floor. We were in Krakow, Poland. W what is it? Oh, this is a safe floor. Uh, safe from what? <laughs> and he says, if, you're, if the day's too much for you, you can go to that floor and chill. Well, the closest I've ever come to chilling, two years ago, we were in Italy, uh, and uh, we hiked up a, a, a Roman ruin to get a glass of wine. We waited 45 minutes for them to even take our order. Sally says, I think we're chilling, Dan. <laughs> Eagles fly above the storm. Bill Gates doesn't chill. Henry Ford didn't chill. I don't chill. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. We've already gone through that drill, yet some of you, I used to be a pretty good golfer, and uh, I only played golf with people. One, I could do something in business with or was a better golfer. But I was a low single digit golfer, so it was tough to find somebody a better golfer. And I gave a talk to a bunch of doctors in Las Vegas about 20 years ago about this many people, and I said, how many play golf? Almost every doctor raises his hand. And I said, uh, who do you play golf with? And one guy said, anybody that can play Wednesday and Friday afternoon. And that's how you've managed your life. Because you've had low expectations. My dad, our dad's goal for me, only one goal, to keep me alive till I reach the age of reason. That's it. He didn't know if it was going to be 20, 30, 40, or ever. And I was still getting in trouble in my early 30s. And I'd already been financially successful. But there's a reason why I haven't driven in 25 years. Um, and it's a good reason, as my wife would attest to, if you've ever seen me behind the wheel. But um, the, um, I now use the excuse, well, at least I can work in the backseat on my computer laptop. But that's not the reason I, I, I stopped driving. I stopped driving because I, I used to get in a lot of trouble. Now, I have three regrets in life. None of them your regrets. I shared them with the vets that we had dinner with last night. Uh, one, I'm a combat trained army military officer, highly trained, who never saw combat. Two, the night before my mother died, I yelled at her, God damn it, don't be a bitch, mom, you're not sick. She's dead the next morning. I'd like to take that one back. Uh, and three, I didn't set my goals high enough. Now, if I didn't set my goals high enough, what can almost everybody in this room say about their goals? 
But I was blessed when I finally did get my head out of my ass and straighten my act up, which the mili- my, our father and my, the military uh, uh, helped me do that. Um, I put myself around as many high-performance people as I possibly could. I was with the Onassis Group for several years with Konstantin Grazos, who was a mentor of mine, who was the CEO of Onassis Shipping, who was the best friend for 60, 65 years of Aristotle Onassis. I was with Siemens, one of the largest conglomerates in, in the world for 10 years, and my mentee, you like, maybe not like you, but you, uh, became CEO of Siemens. And I put myself in difficult positions where the tasks were hard, and I could measure my results, unlike personal development. Because being all you can be is, is a full-time job. I've never seen a, a part-time high-performance person. Elon Musk is not a part-time high performer, notwithstanding smoking a joint on Joe Rogan, which I didn't smoke a joint on Joe Rogan. That's probably the only thing Mr. Musk and I have in common, other than he may have stood in this room once, is that, um, but um, he's not a part-time guy. None of the super high performer guys, and he's obviously an iconic genius, given all that. Uh, Steve Jobs, who I did know, uh, uh, was an iconic genius, uh, and he wasn't part-time. Everything was devoted to his life vis-a-vis Apple in those days. Can you say even something remotely similar about your work ethic? Elon Musk has, has ran it on about 100 hour work weeks. A guy that works 100 hours can get twice as much done in uh, the same time period as a guy or gal only works 40 hours. Success leaves clues. You pissed a lot of people off. What did you do? I told them the fucking truth. I'm on the waiting list at three Ivy League schools to speak. I've been on the waiting list three years. Yeah, I'm probably going to be on the waiting list three more years. I understand that. But I have spoken at Oxford. Uh, little, a few speed bumps getting the talk at Oxford. I, and uh, the moderator. Uh, I said uh, the F word, I said fuck twice, and after the first time I turned, I said, oh, I'm not supposed to say that, right? And I kind of made a quasi deal, and he said, no, but you already did. And there were four or five, uh, attract- there were a lot of attractive ga- gals there, but there were four or five that were sitting in the front that wanted to ask a question. I said, hey, cutie pie, you, you with a yellow sweater. Now, you can't talk that way. But I do, and I'm not going to change. We're at that same University of Krakow, and I'm not re- this, these are not recommendations for what you should do. Like Pontius Pilate, I'm washing my hands, but I'm going to tell you anyway. We're at Krakow, and we're having dinner. Sally's sitting here, and I'm sitting here, and a mentee's sitting across from me. And a very attractive uh, a young student who's working, you know, a lot of kids work. They're not all rich like your parents, right? A lot of kids work. And she's explaining to me the um, menu in English, and... So I'm sitting like this, and I, just, I naturally just put my hand around her waist onto the left part of her upper buttocks. I mean, I'm just, I just didn't think anything about it. And then when she, got, she left, she was happy, and she left. The guy, the mentee sitting there says, Mr. Penny, did you realize what you did? So, now, I have artificial needs because Sally kicks me so much under the table. But <laughs> Sally said, she says, you were touching the girl's backside. Okay, I'll apologize next time. Two nights later, same restaurant, same waitress. She comes, now she leans into me, she puts her breast into my ear, like this. And I got my hand, and I completely forgot to apologize. The, um, but my generation, I'm not suggesting you do that, but... I didn't think I did anything wrong. Now, if I embarrassed her, or I, I, I would gladly apologize. But um, see, we've gone, we've gone way, way the other way. We've gone to in the 18th, uh, 19th century where everything was too tight. Now we've gone, in my humble opinion, and there's nothing humble about me, things are not loosey-goosey, but liberal to a fault, in my judgment. And uh, if the guys that you look up to, some of the iconic figures you look up to, if you could talk to them one-on-one, without cameras, without mics, they almost all agree with me. Now, at a fine institution like this, we all know what the bell curve is. 
But I'm talking about not being in the uh, uh, second or third deviation from the mean on the left side, the positive mean, but I'm talking about being in the top, not one-tenth, but one-hundredth of a percent. I tell the kids, change a billion lives, two things will happen. One, you'll be rich. Two, you can then use the money to go save the world. Now the kids want to save the world without making a dime. You come up with an idea that changes a billion lives. Uh, one recent one is Facebook, obviously. Mr. Zuckerberg has changed more than a billion lives. He's changed two or three or four billion lives. And he's gotten rich, right? I'm not going to argue whether he should be CEO of a public company or whatever that is. Uh, I'm not here to argue whether uh, Elon should be uh, CEO of a public company. Having been CEO of a big public company, I got out right at the right time. I would have gotten so much trouble. I mean, God, oh my, I, can't, I can't even imagine how much trouble I would have gotten. Because at one time, I owned 60% uh, of a public company, so I kind of relate to Elon uh, and Mark, and I didn't give a fuck what the shareholders said. Wrongfully. But I justified that nobody had more money to lose on investment opportunities than me. Which was true, because I own 60% of the public stock. But think about how you can change a billion lives and you'll be instantaneously wealthy. Now, I had a dream a long time ago, and this was my dream, more or less. This is where I wanted to live. I wanted to raise our children. And um, 17 months later, that's where I lived. A million permutations had to happen. And all this information I'm giving you is free on my site. Affirmations. I'm a big believer in affirmations as... World-class athletes know affirmations, goal-setting and affirmations. But that's what I wanted. And uh, we celebrated our 35th anniversary uh, a few uh, weeks ago. But how can an East L.A. barrio bad boy who tried to kill his teacher in the sixth grade, who had been arrested five times, flunked out of universities, no-name universities. I went in 1964 to San Jose State University because Playboy magazine had voted at the Playboy School of the Year. So I went there on probation and immediately flunked out. But that was my decision-making process where I went to school. And I'm not sorry that I, that I went to school there. I have some people uh, in my family, not my kid brother, but uh, say, why do you say that goddamn story? It makes us look like all idiots. Well, as my, my kid brother would say, most of them are idiots. They just happen to have our blood running through their veins, but they're still idiots. Strange times are these in which we live when old and young are taught falsehoods in school and the person that dares to tell the truth is called at once a lunatic and fool. Plato was saying this shit 420 years before Christ. It's not new. It's not new. Yet, why would, why would people try to invent patterns for you to follow, back up. Unless the person has made a lot of money in what he's teaching you, I don't know why you listen to him. My wife and others have said, but Dan, maybe five or $10 million is a lot of money to the most kids that listen to these guys. Some of these guys, I'm talking about gurus in general. Some of these guys have made five million bucks. Some of these guys have made 10 million bucks. Which, well, humbly speaking, that's chump change. So if you feel that that is your benchmark in life, then guess what? You will never exceed your most high, highest and wild expectation. If you want to make a million dollars, you're not going to make 10. If you want to make 10, you're not going to make 100. If you want to make 100, you're not going to make a billion. Because subconsciously, you'll start to shut down when you get, if it's a billion, million, 900,000, 970,000, and by the time you get it, uh, you cross the finish line with a billion and one dollar. One of the things that I learned as a young man is what I just said, you will never exceed your high, highest and wildest and craziest expectation. So when I came up with the idea of the castle from before, 
Many, many things had to happen. And that happened and I made them happen. I often get asked by kids, although we've got some gray hair here, about the work-life balance. And I like to read Jack Welsh, in my judgment, the greatest CEO over the last 75 years of GE fame. There's no such thing as work-life balance. They're work-life choices. And you make them, and they have consequences. This is a young man that took a company that was uh, with 400,000 employees, more or less, uh, and had um, about um, one, uh, 100, uh, excuse me, 13 billion in revenue to a company that had 130,000 employees. He got rid of 300,000 employees, and he increased the revenue to 150 billion. He had a system called rank and yank. I'd rank you. Every, 20, every other year or every third year, I fired 20% of the low performers. The truth is, he fired 40% every other year. They used to call him Neutron Jack, because a neutron bomb killed the people but saved the building and equipment. Why is it that the harshness of successful CEOs nobody wants to focus on? Well, we know why because it's the antithesis of what you've been taught. How can you justify your dad working at uh, Pennsylvania Power, I guess they must have a Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Power in life for 35 years, and get a pension at $46,000, have a master's degree in engineering, be arguably smart, how can you justify that? You can't. But nobody asks the hard questions. When you get around at Christmas or Thanksgiving, which I guess people still do, get around Christmas and Thanksgiving, what do you talk about? Oh, dad has been there 29 years and he's never going to make it past vice president and he's got a bad heart and we're going to run out of money before they die? That's not what you talk about, is it? I talk about it, i.e. I'm not invited to any family functions. <laughs> now, this is you, okay? Carlin, this is you down at the bottom. Okay, you got some dreams. You got to get by pessimists, just rejection, haters, society, friends, relatives, guilt, fear, doubt, and in some cases, your boss. It's no wonder you don't make it. It's no wonder. And you're growing, play it safe, you're told. You've changed. You should be happy with what you are or what you have. All of us have heard that. When you get out of the school, for those of you that are students, I saw that the average salary for a guy with a bachelor's degree is $67,000. I was in fucking shock when I read that. Why would you spend the kind of goddamn money to go here for $67,000 goddamn dollars? And that's the ones that get a job. We're not factoring in the poor bastards that can't get a job. Holy Toledo, I was stunned. And then when I saw how much it costs to go here, Jesus, now, now I understand student debt. I really never could understand student debt before. If you're only making 60, 70 when you get out and you gotta pay back 200 and you gotta live in a portion, I mean, holy Toledo, you'll be 40 years old and still paying off student debt. It makes no sense. And this school is at one of the highest tuition costs. But all the Ivy League schools have, you get out of school, you make 60 to 70, unless you get a graduate degree, and then it's somewhat higher. But for the first time, student debt resonated with me. Now, to date, all the information that you've learned is this. This is dinosaur shit. You have learned nothing, or next to nothing. And in some cases, they put negative information in you that has made it almost impossible to succeed. I believe in generational wealth. What, generational wealth, depending on 20 to 25 years, what do you consider a generation? And we do it in three to seven years. And we have countless examples. And for those of you that have seen my website, we've got everything from teenage multimillionaires flying around their own goddamn jet plane to the largest deal in recorded history, Neom, 500 billion, and everything in between. Now, I just recently see that some of the gurus are talking about revenue produced. 
top line. The highest one that I've seen is, I think, 18 billion. Um, so one of my crack staff, and the reason I say crack is because it sounds like crap. One of my crack staff said, oh, we've done a lot more than that, Mr. Pena. Why don't we run the numbers? The first blush that they came back, cursory look. In a half a day, $125 billion in revenue. They think my revenue numbers will exceed my equity numbers. I don't know that. You can't believe accountants and computer scientists because you can make a spreadsheet say any damn thing you want. But so far, crap. And remember, everything I'm saying is free on my site. Now, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt or the, the a reverse benefit or la, not, the, the lack of a benefit and say that probably only one or two or five of you were, have been programmed to be a super successful, successful kid. Some of you might argue, but you weren't programmed other than you believed in Superman and that kind of stuff when you were a kid. You weren't programmed. You were, you were better off than the only goal our dad had for me was to keep me alive until the age of reason. It wasn't that bad. No, maybe we got some gang bangers and, uh, you know, every once in a while, we, uh, there's kids in the audience, just got out of prison, etc. I've coached uh, multiple murder, uh, murders, a guy that did two murders, so whatever that's called, and so uh, that turned his life around. That happens. Rarely, but it does happen. It happens a lot more in the movies than in real life. But I didn't want to be this. I wanted to be a priest when I was a kid, believe it or not. Most people don't believe it. Hmm. Now, these kids were programmed for success. The Williams sisters. Since they're two, three years old, their dad was savage to them. Brutal. All the words that describe me. They had no little dolls. They had no playtime. All they did was hit goddamn tennis balls. And what did it produce? What did it produce? Now, I don't know the Williams girls. I have met their father before. Uh, from Compton. Poverty stricken. But he had a dream. And he fulfilled it with his daughters. And thank Allah, his daughters were gifted athletes. You can have all the dreams you want to be a world-class tennis player, but if you don't have the tools, you know, you're, you're pissing in the wind. Now... This is little Tiger Woods when he's three years old on television, Bob Hope Show. He was programmed. Now, I have met Tiger, and I knew his father. His father was brutal. I saw his father slap and beat him till Tiger cried for coming in second in a golf tournament. Today, it's called child abuse. What our dad did to me, he let up on Vince a little, because Vince, I'm quite a bit, many years older than he is, was child abuse. But our far father were here, and they'd say, uh, his brother and sister, which are older, would say, Manny, aren't you being too hard on Danny? And he says, well, how's your program with your crack whore daughter working out? Or how's your, pro your program with your convicted felon son working out? Our father believed in results. He believed in results. Yet, when I got a lot of awards many years ago, and he's being interviewed on television, and they asked, aren't you proud of uh, Danny Pena? And um, uh, he said, yes, I'm very proud of my son, Dan, uh, but I'm not the reason for his success. He, he's successful not because of me, but in spite of me. Now, if your parents are living vicariously through you guys in this audience, what the fuck does that say about your parents? How successful are you? Now, I'm going to make an exaggeration. This is a Trumpism. My wife has lost, in fur coats and jewelry, traveling more than the highest net worth in this room. I'm going to say it again slow for you meatheads. My wife has lost, in fur coats and jewelry, traveling over our life together, than the highest net worth in this room. So how successful are you? Now, money's not everything, kids. No. But it's the only thing anybody counts. If it's not the most important thing, it's one of the top three things. But why is it the only thing they count? 
Because with money, you can change lives. Now, the pundits tell me I've changed at least two million lives. Now, what does that mean? I've made two million people wealthy? Well, I, I'm, I'm sure I've made 10 million people wealthy because most people, they have low expectations. If they make one or two or three million dollars, they're happy. I've had mentees over 26 years that say, I want, I want 100 million dollars, 100 million. They make 15 million dollars, I never see them again. I want billion dollars, billion dollars. They make 45 million dollars, I never see them again. There's a difference between talking about making $100 million and having $45 million in the bank, and it's a damn good feeling. The, the, break, the, uh, the, uh, the breaking point was when you have about $250 million in the bank after taxes. That's kind of a comfort zone. <laughs> it's a comfort zone. It gives you a nice warm feeling in your belly. And my belly's getting bigger, so I need more warmth in there than I used to. So there was Tiger. So I knew as long as he didn't give up, he was going to win again. And he did. Although he did say on television, there were times I thought I would never do it again, but I was never going to give up. You've heard Elon Musk say, I'd never give up. You've heard all these guys say, I'd never give up. Thomas Edison, who didn't go to school here, but he said it was a 98% perspiration and 2% inspiration. But he never gave up. He allegedly uh, did 10,000 experiments. I would have paid some two or three dipshit engineers from Penn to do all those experiments. And you know, I, I wouldn't have done 10,000 experiments myself. But those kids are programmed. Now, some will say, of course, the new uh, tennis uh, uh, young goddess, Coco Gauff, I always believe I could come back. For those of you that saw her play in uh, Wimbledon, She's a phenomenon. But she's been playing tennis since she's shorter than the tennis racket. And her parents have programmed her. Now, my parents programmed me a little differently. Now, you know I'm first generation Mexican. My mom and grand, uh, grandma swam across the Rio Grande River in 1924 illegally. And I've created 50 billion, so you know, was, was I a good illegal? But this is what my parents did to me that's different than every single person in this room. Number one, I'm born at the end of the war, atomic bombs. They had nothing to do with that, but come back to East LA. As soon as I could more or less walk, they gave me dancing lessons, free dancing lessons. Arthur Murray, for those of you that are old enough to remember Arthur Murray, $10 a month dancing lessons, ballroom dancing. Ballroom dancing in East LA as a grammar school kid was a recipe for death. Next, they gave me free tennis le golf lessons at Wilson Park. First, very few people played golf. My first golf clubs were a Patty Berg, 1995 from Sears and Roba, cut down four clubs. I think I had a three wood, a putter, a nine iron, and a five iron, if I remember correctly. They gave me free tennis lessons at Wilson Park. So now we got ballroom dancing, golf, and tennis in East LA. Next, they allowed me to believe in the Santa Claus, Easter Bunny, and Tooth Fairy way long after I should. Cousin Twinkie says I was 14 years old and still believed in the Tooth Fairy. That's an exaggeration, but I was older than a lot of kids. I used to get in a lot of fights because I'd say Santa Claus, and they say, you know who Santa Claus is, it's your parents, yada, yada. But one of the most important things, Spanish was their first language, and they would not speak Spanish in the home. Because they didn't want me speaking English with a Mexican accent. Now, in this much more liberal society we live in than 70 plus years ago, perhaps that's not as important. But to my mother, who was illegal till she was 30 something and came across the, you know, the Rio Grande River, it was extremely important. So I grew up speaking English with no accent. And my mother found a book quite by serendipity by Dr. Benjamin Spock in Reader's Digest, 1946, that was written on child rearing. Up till a few years ago, it was the most highly sought after and paid for book in the history of the world, 55 million copies. For those of you that have kids seven or under, I recommend you get it. 
For those of you that have grandchildren, seven or under, I suggest you get it. For those of you that have kids, eight and older, you're finished. Don't worry about it. They're fucked already. You can't retrieve it. And last but not least, they only let me listen to classical music in the fucking barrio. My favorite were Mozart, Beethoven, Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky's concerto number one in B-flat minor, opus 21. I can hum it today. And I still did bad shit. Just imagine if those things hadn't been done. The only difference between me and the gangbangers is I didn't speak, hey, man, hey, hey say, what's happening with you? But I can, I can talk that way if, if I need to or want to or have to. So in their way, I was programmed. Now that's our grandson. For those of you that can't read his little t-shirt, he's one year old. It says future legend. I wanted to say future fucking legend, but <laughs> our youngest son, we're going to do everything humanly possible because he will be programmed. He will be programmed. Now, your parents that are living vicariously through you didn't have those kind of aspirations. It's a shitty thing to say, but most of you should roll down the inside of your mama's leg. What good? When the Greenpeace and the people are talking about saving the world, I ask myself, what in the fuck have they done for this planet other than march around a goddamn embassy? Nothing. Now, whoops, whoops, whoops. These are the schools in the United States that the most Fortune 500 CEOs come out of. Now look at that list, because the schools that you would think are on there aren't on there. Number one, Stanford. Number two, Penn State. Three, Harvard. University of California, Berkeley. MIT, Stanford University Graduate School. Harvard University. Instead, the Wharton School. And Northwestern. Now, our children went to two of those schools, not by coincidence, because rubbing elbows with like DNA, good stuff happens. And that's why the Ivy League schools, not just this Ivy League school, the Ivy League schools have done so well for two or 300 years, because somebody figured that out a long time ago. Same as Oxford and Cambridge in those schools. Somebody figured it out. It's not perfect because you can still die, die from a drug overdose at Oxford or at, uh, at Yale or here, for that matter. But you're better off because you, you're putting them in, in a like gene pool. And that sounds very awful. What are we going to structure the way the kids come out? I hope the shit we do. I hope the shit we do. We are brought, into, um, brought in innocent to this life, then life happens. Most info given rough successes is wrong unless you are lucky enough to have high performance parents. Now, it's questionable whether you're lucky enough because our kids had high, have high performance people. We are. But we know that you can overdo it. Our boys played tennis in the snow. We had a tennis court. Our boys had to hit 500 balls a day in addition to playing five sets. Our boys dress for dinner. To this day, our youngest son can't stand to put a tuxedo on because he was wearing it when he was three, four, and five. Our kids don't like tennis anymore, although they do like golf. We built a golf course. It's convenient to play golf. They have their own golf carts. They like golf. But a lot of the things we did, we overdid. So you can have too much of a good thing. But I'm, I believe you kill an ant with a sledgehammer. You don't kill it with tweezers because you want to make sure that a son of a bitch is dead. So I, over the top, my, two of my nicknames in the corporate world are the hammer and the hatchet. I don't give you, I have to give you more metaphors than that. But when you want to get some shit done, you come to me. The Guthrie Group, which we're not really practicing now, our, our, our motto used to be, whatever McKenzie charge you, we'll do it for 10%. 
and we'll do it in a fifth of the time. And not a 500-page report, a 50-page report. McKinsey's one of the leading uh, consulting companies in the world. We say the same for uh, Boston or any of the others. You are forged by what you have seen and done. You do not what you, your parents told you. You do what you see them do. In your entire lives, what have you experienced? Weak, lackluster parents, no high-performance role model, low bar expectations, little or no accountability, little or no responsibility, leading to little or no accomplishments, leading to our snowflake society. I believe with all my heart, political correctness is a manifestation of lack of self-esteem. I'm going to say it again. I believe with all my heart, political correctness is a manifestation of lack of self-esteem. I didn't understand growing up that everybody didn't have self-esteem. My young brother here, kid brother, and I, who had a savage, brutal, ball-busting, alpha male dad that hung around, if he hung, with alpha males, ball-busting, savage, high-performance people, we thought everybody was like that. Little did I understand that most people are snowflakes. We have a success test, a, um, a snowflake test. On the snowflake test, we have 96% failure rate on my site, free. One of the questions is, uh, what would you do if somebody uh, spit in your mother's face when you're walking down the street? Oh, well, thank you. The, the, the most often answer used is, I would try to ascertain the state of mind that he was in when he spit on my mom. Now, what kind of fucking answer is that? I agree with the man, uh, the man and the lady. I would either find, if I couldn't beat him to death with my fist, I'd find something to beat him to death. There are certain things worthy of going to jail for. That's one of them. That's one of them. So then we said, well, that may, that's too harsh and too brutal. So we have another test, uh, and it's called uh, 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 super success test. So we, we phrase the questions more politically correct. And uh, one of the questions is like this. Um, would you co not physically confront, verbally confront, somebody that said something not nice to your um, girlfriend, significant other, mom? We had a higher flunk rate than that. 98.4%. So it's not that you don't want to punch them in the mouth. You just don't want confrontation because you're pleasers. Now, I have a friend named Ronnie, a cousin, who in 1961-ish went to Lincoln High School. A guy said that his girlfriend, uh, her butt looked like uh, pigs in a gunny sack. <laughs> Ronnie... Stabbed the guy 17 times. By the grace of Allah, he wasn't worth a shit with a knife. The guy didn't die. So our dad sent him away to a youth, like a junior pen penitentiary. Um, what's ha I mean, I'm not telling you to go out and hit people with bricks. But if you're not willing to stand, I'm, well, I don't think your mothers are worth a shit anyway because they did a bad job. That aside... I mean, don't you stand up for your rights or any of that shit anymore? The answer is no. Snowflake means you melt under pressure. You melt under pressure. Now, I don't, now don't go away and put on uh, some blog, opinions, promoter. I'm not promoting a goddamn thing. I'm just telling you what's happened. It's for you to make that decision. Our dad made $142 a month after World War II being a cop. It's hard to believe, 142. He had to get two extra jobs, security jobs. One at May Company, one at Sears and Roebuck. He got 85 or $90 reserve money. He stayed in the reserves after World War II. And for that 85 or 90 he got recalled to the Korean War. Now, and I know some of you work a job, some of you work two or three jobs. But when you're trying to put food on the table for, you know, a few kids, and uh, you allegedly served, you know, and served your country. And back in those days, me, after World War II and the Korean War, they were saying, thank, thank you for your service. When I came back from the Vietnam conflict, they spit on me. 
We used to have to carry baseball bats to get to class. And now, last night at, at dinner, I thank the vets for their service, and I thank all, all the kids uh, that are veterans. First responders, I thank for your service. But the world's changed. And maybe that, people say, the psychiatrist, the Freuds in you, will think, well, maybe that's what framed his life when they spit on him coming to class to take cost accounting. No, what probably framed my life is when I busted his head and I shaved part of his skull off with one swipe. Maybe that shaved my head, and maybe that's why I'm aggressive. <laughs> At University of Toronto, they said I needed security. They were afraid for my uh, life. And we have security in the room. They're hiding someplace. And I said, I don't need security. So we go there, and I bought a cricket bat. And the cricket bat was on the podium. And during a lonely conversation, one of the kids in the audience said, oh, Mr. Pena, Mr. Pena, what's that thing there? It's a cricket bat. And I picked it up like this. And I said, uh, he said, what is it for? And I said, well, the university called me and said I needed security. And I put it down. And he didn't. He says, well, what do you do with it? <laughs> what do you do with it? And uh, this is Canada, OK. Uh, um, and um, I said, because the first three or four guys don't want to be the first to get hit with a cricket bat, that's going to keep the other 400 back. That's the theory. But 400 guys, and I think I'm pretty, I, I, know, I know I'm pretty tough, 400 is they roll over me like a, a tsunami. But the kids want to know why I carry a cricket bat. Well, I don't carry it anymore. It's tough to get in the suitcase. But anyway, I don't do that anymore. Uh, but this school called and said, I needed security and that I should double security. For telling the truth? I don't think so. But for telling information that is contrary to what you want to hear, maybe. Because my message doesn't resonate with a lot of kids. But my demographics in the last 10 years have changed from 35 to 55, my age spread, now 15 to 35. Why would 15-year-olds follow me? We have 13, 14-year-olds that are making $100,000, $150,000 a year. 13, 14. Their parents think they're doing drugs. 13, 14. Because the kids now, in my day, in our day, if dad said bullshit, we just put our head down and don't say anything. Now, you tell bullshit to your kids, they Google it, and they say, well, dad's full of shit. Mom's full of shit. And so then they Google and they find me on YouTube, etc., uh, and other people. Why, uh, how many of you know who Jocko is, the uh, fit, uh, fitness guy, the uh, uh, SEAL? Why do you think Jocko is one of the most popular guys online? Former Navy SEAL, uh, uh, led the um, most highly decorated uh, SEAL unit in Fallujah, if my, my memory serves me, because he is a man. A real, live man that doesn't squat to pee. And there aren't many of us around anymore. And you don't have to be an alpha male. The good news is 98% of the high-performance people are introverts, just like you. Elon Musk is an introvert. Warren Buffett's an introvert. Elon, um, Zuckerberg's an introvert. It's only 2% of the loud mouths, like myself, that are extroverts. And only 10% of the, that 2% that are alpha males. It's not easy to find an alpha male anymore. Most are beta males. Nothing wrong with the beta male. Almost all the billionaires are not alpha males. There's maybe uh, uh, 1 or 2% of them are, 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 are alpha male. But you don't have to be an alpha male loud mouth to act like you had a pair. You don't. So he made 142. Now, some of the kids asked me, well, don't you ever get depressed, and what do you think about it? And as I was, uh, when I got out of uh, school and I got out in the real world, uh, I used to focus back on the first day I made $2,000, 1971. First day, which in today's dollars is about 12000 And I used to get myself jacked up, and I was going to go and make a sale, because I was a salesman. And then after that, uh, in 1974, the first day I made $10,000. And I used to get all jacked up and, you know, go and sell, you know, 
And uh, in today's dollars, that's about $54,000. By, by this time, I was living large. $10,000 in a day in 1974 was large. I went out and bought five, six new suits. I bought a new Mercedes, blah, 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 blah. pissed the money right down, wrapped it, yep, gone. You know, a money, a money and a kid are easily separated, believe me. Uh, and then, in uh, 1984, I made 100 million pounds in a day, which then was equivalent to 271 million, or, or 271 million pounds today, which is about $350 million in a day. Now, I don't need to, you know, pump myself up anymore. And I tell the kids that one of the questions I ask the kids, what's the highest, highest performance thing you've ever done? What's the highest performance thing your, your significant other has ever done? What's the highest performing thing your mother or father have ever done? What's the highest performing thing that your grandpa's ever done? And it's zero, 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 zero. So why would you expect to be a high performing goddamn person? By Sarah and Dippity? Some of you, your grandparents, the older ones in there, the highest performing thing is they served in World War II, the highest, which is, is admirable or the Korean War, whatever. But if they're all zeros, most poor people equate success with education. Some of you are here for that reason. But the average paycheck for the student that comes out of this goddamn place is $67,000. Something doesn't equate. Now, that's uh, a few days ago, a few weeks ago, that was the 30, uh, this is the 35th anniversary. That's me when I was young. I used to wear a bowler. I pulled out my first 20 million on a deal in London. Do I look happy? I think so. I think so. Um, the, um, but now I'm living vicariously off my students, my mentees. I mean, when uh, the kids come up with these things, and we had a, uh, he's not really a halfwit, he's not really a mongoloid, but we had a kid in New York, uneducated though, that's the truth. Uh, he, uh, he said, well, what's my return on investment? Because a lot of you guys want to know, guys, what's the ROI in this? Now, I'm not selling the seminar. Seminar sold out for a year, but he went to the seminar, spent 20 grand. Seven months later, he made $40 million. And he didn't go to Penn, Harvard, or... He didn't go any place. Half Puerto Rican, half this, half monkey, half, I don't know what the fuck he is. But he's a half-breed. But he's a rich half-breed. I, I, I don't mind being a half-breed as long as I'm rich. You know, I don't care. I don't care. But that, that you know, that was me. And I, can, and when I, I get a chill when I see that picture. My, the kids, our kids don't believe that's me. But it is me. It is me. Uh, uh, it, it is one thing to study war and others to live the, the warrior's life. It's lonely at the top. And for those of you that have, have troubles being alone, uh, being an uh, all-you-can-be person isn't for you. For those of you that need to go to the pub and the bar and with your mates on Friday and Saturday, this program is not for you. Our kids celebrated Christmas more in January than December. Daddy, why don't, why aren't we celebrating Christmas with everybody else? Because Daddy's doing a deal. Or they used to say, gunning and hunting. If you're not willing to make those personal sacrifices, all the billionaires and all the billions save one guy married a billion. He asked me, should I marry her? I says, is she really rich? She's a billion, billion and a half. Don't ask those kind of questions. Just marry her. You'll learn to love her. And if you don't learn to love her, you'll at least learn to like her. <laughs> a billion dollars makes up for a lot of stuff. It does. Um, but um, the, um, you need to set your, your benchmarks higher. Now, you're desperate to fit in. Now, this kid doesn't know it's dangerous. One of the exercises we do with the kids is, what did you do to, to scare yourself today? Most of you can't say anything because you're living within your comfort zone. OK? When I was a kid, my parents were worried about me living to 20. They used to send me into biker bars. And uh, I'd piss on a guy's boot and run out in the parking lot. 
Now, it didn't always work out for us, but I mean, uh, you know, and I was the smallest of the kids, so these kids were pretty tough. Uh, but w we were constantly doing crazy shit. Um, I didn't realize I was expanding my comfort zone. But this little kid, you know, doesn't know that's dangerous. Now this is me, 13 years old, wrestling with a lion. Yeah, people get hurt. My mother's standing off in the background screaming and crying. But my, our father used to have me do stuff to consider, uh, not consider, to continue my expansion of my comfort zone. And he said that, uh, remember, it's not what happens to you in life, it's how you respond to it. So when bad things happen to me over my life, I would just put them in, in perspective. Was I alive? Yes. Was I beat up? A lot of times. But um, I was just sharing with my brother earlier tonight, when I was almost beat to death in a, uh, in a jail, I had it coming. Not almost beat to death, but I had a beating coming. But they uh, went overboard because when the police used to call our father, we've got Danny down here, and he says, what did he do? Anybody hurt? And he says, no. Well, you know what to do with him. This is Friday. Take me out in the parking lot, beat me half to death, not to the infirmary, back in jail. Saturday afternoon, come out and beat me again. Back in jail, come out Sunday, beat me again. Then Dad would pick me up Monday afternoon. I never forgot those incidences. And it was worse when I tried to fight back because I thought I was tough. Dad used to just keep, keep your hands in your pocket and take a goddamn beating. You deserve it. That was very difficult for me to do, being the extrovert that I was. But whoop, long one, OK. Sally and I still expand our comfort zone. Yeah, people get hurt. You can see Sally walking behind me a little. Uh, but we still continue to do this stuff. I'm not afraid of big cats. I'm just not. I'm not afraid of big animals. But I've also been run over by a buffalo. Almost killed in Australia, 1991. Now, some people say I gave up hunting because of that incident. Coincidentally, it was my last hunt. Qu whether that's the reason, or maybe I was going vegan, I don't know why. <laughs> but that was my last hunt. Crocodile Dundee, there was a real Crocodile Dundee that the movies were after, named Barry Leeds. Please. And uh, I went down to Australia, and uh, I rented him and his establishment for three weeks. <coughs> and I told him I wanted a, as big a Cape Buffalo, as uh, a water buffalo, excuse me, as we could get. So we, we went to Darwin. And you dress with a black tie, gamble a couple nights, and then you go out in the bush. And we're out in the bush, and he's whispering. Why are we whispering? He says, we're in Abo land. Abo land. What does that mean? We're in Aborigine land, where we're not supposed to hunt. I go, I, I pay you $100,000 to go take me to a place I'm not supposed to hunt? You wacko. Anyway, we did find a, a big buffalo. Excuse me. And, uh, the, um, and it was a pond about half as big as this room. And he says, I'm going to throw rocks on the, on the buffalo. And he's going to spin around. And he's going to go this way. And in those days, I used to hunt with a 454 console handgun. And he says, you'll be able to get him as he's coming out of the water. Well, never underestimate how wrong you can be. He spun around and came right over the top of me. So as I fell back, I squeezed off a shot and hit him under his chin through his nose. But missed his brain. That's why, I, you know, I was just pulling the trigger. I wasn't so smart. I thought I was going to hit his brain. And he uh, hit me in my hip, which now I have an artificial hip. And this shoulder, I have an artificial shoulder, uh, as he ran over me. And I, I shake myself off. And, uh, and I'm pissed off. And so uh, I'm limping along, chasing him into the jungle. And uh, I'm taking a shot every time I get within about 20 meters. And boom. But I can't tell if I'm hitting him or not. Because he's just running like crazy. Then all of a sudden, he turns around, just like in the movies. They really do that before they charge, and he charged me. So by the way, what Carlin is, I squeeze the last, it's empty, click. And the buffalo dropped dead at my feet. And what Barry was yelling at me, you're out of fucking ammo! <laughs> but my adrenaline was pumped up so hard. Whether that's the reason um, I stopped hunting or not, I'm not positive. But it was the last hunt. So I haven't 
killed anything on four legs in almost 30 years. But I was always trying to press the envelope. Part of which, our dad was an all-American athlete, and I was a shitty athlete. Uh, shitty isn't even how you can describe me. My football coach, uh, Roy J, said, Pina, you're so fucking slow, you should wear the other team's jersey. Now, if he had told you that, how would it have affected you? And I was slow. Was I slow enough to play for the other team, being on my team? Mm, I don't think I was that bad, but I was a very poor athlete. But my dad used to say, our dad used to say, you know, um, it's not what happens to you, I've, it's how you interpret it. So I interpreted that I was going to have to do better things than just be a jock. That's how I justified it in my little mind as a 16, 17-year-old kid. Now the jocks make big, big money. Maybe that wasn't such a great idea. But back in those days, that's what I, I told myself. Now, that's a silverback gorilla. That's not photoshot in Rwanda. Um, that's, uh, and if you ever get the opportunity, it's very expensive. Silverback gorillas are like golden. They're, it's a religious experience being around them. And the silverback gorillas like blondes because uh, they, uh, they can touch you, but you can't touch them. So they chased Sally around up there, uh, and uh, we went up twice. Uh, we skipped a year. That's Charlie. His job all day, he has 17 wives. All he does is eat and fornicate. <laughs> That's all he does to prolong the species. And he's protected. He's got a massive amount of guards protecting him because the people poach him. Because he'll come right up to you because, you know, they haven't been hunted in a long, long time. And there we are again. Sally and I were trekking with the lions. Uh, that lion wasn't too friendly. That's why I'm as far away from him as I am. Uh, but, um, but like in real life, the lady lions do all the work. The male lions, all they do is eat and fornicate as well. And I'm still pressing the envelope. You can see uh, the bungee is not attached to my feet like normal. It's attached to my waist because I have artificial knees. My knees could dislocate. But at that age, I didn't know. I Googled it afterwards. When you snap at the bottom of the, uh, the bungee, your cataracts can get knocked out because cataracts are not attached as strongly when you get old. But I don't, I don't like to uh, confuse myself with the facts. Uh, I didn't uh, Google anything. And then I'm jumping out of the stratosphere in Las Vegas. And this is, this is photoshot. I didn't land on my feet like it shows there, 895 feet, because I didn't think posterity should see me landing on my head. So we doctored before we went on YouTube. But I didn't land on my feet like that shows. I landed on my shoulder, my head, um, and the uh, very undignified. Uh, but it's, it's, quite, it's quite a rush. Um, once you become fearless, life becomes limitless. One of the questions I ask the audiences and the, the school kids, what, how would your life be today if you weren't afraid? How would your life be if you weren't afraid? What would you have done that you didn't do if you weren't afraid? Physically afraid? Emotionally afraid? Afraid of what other people will think? Afraid of what other people might do? What would you be like? Where would you be today? If I coulda, woulda, shoulda. Nobody in this room can say that they'd be just like they are now because we've all had instances that we should have done something, but we didn't. Con conventional wisdom, which isn't wisdom, it's just conventional. I still remember the couple times when I was growing up that I, I backed down from a fight. I shouldn't have done that. I, I still remember it at 74. I should have hit that fucker with a brick and severed his fucking head off his shoulders. Now, I've got all kinds of excuses why I didn't. I was this, that, blah, 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 blah. When I, got, uh, I finally got up to being a senior in high school, the uh, vice principal uh, pulled us in and gave us our diplomas, th three of the worst kids on, on campus, Walt, Ruben, and myself. Uh, Ruben's serving life for murder in Florida, one of my mates I used to chill with. And so we went down to the pool hall three weeks before graduation, and Walt said after seven or eight, nine pitchers of beer, 
You know, Martin Luther King's marching. We got rights. So we went back to campus. We kicked the door in of the boys' vice principal, and we took our diplomas and threw them in his face. You can't keep us from graduation. And then I made the famous thing, I'm going to burn this fucking school down. <laughs> now today, I'd be CNN incarcerated, right? But in those days, and I did try to burn the school down only once. I was not successful. I'm not a great arsonist. I don't like fire, Vince. But I've always tried to do things, partially because of our strong alpha male dad. Um, and because uh, I saw him every day. Uh, he was, by the way, he was a, a cop turned CIA turned come assassin. And if you, ma if you Google our father's name, Manny Pena, he killed, assassinated, or was involved in the assassination of between 13 and 23 people, depending on what story you want to be, believe. We were discussing some of the truth or half-truths of it. And my wife, until he died, would ask him. He was brought out of retirement to handle the Sirhan Sirhan case. Sirhan assassinated Robert Kennedy supposedly to cover up, um, and he just giggled. He wouldn't neither confirm nor deny anything. He just giggled, and Sally'd give him some more chocolate ice cream, which he, <laughs> which he became very fond of in his old age. Now, we're getting in the clothes here, kids. To utilize what's on my website free, and I hope you all go to it, um, if you're interested in being more than you are today. Not just financially, but I, I principally lean on the finances because if you have money, you can do almost anything. You can make miracles happen. I mean, um, you have to have some sense of leadership. Most of the kids don't have any because their parents didn't have any leadership, except for the veterans. Um, you've never been exposed to leadership. This very university is more or less run by the students, which in my humble opinion, and again, nothing humble about me, is uh, more or less a recipe for disaster. What experience does a 17, 18, 19, 20-year-old kid have? Zero. Why would you let, allow them to have any decision-making prowess or power? But that's a whole other story. I, I could lecture a week on that. But leadership is lacking. Command of your uh, life allows few intimacies. And today, you want to be liked. You want to fit in. And therefore, why Facebook is so popular. I tell kids, you want to save your life. You want to save your career. You want to be all you can be. Get off all social media tonight. Change your phone number tonight. Don't look back starting tonight. It's already been proven that Facebook builds neuroses. It's people living vicariously off of somebody else, a dipshit that's probably lying. Yet it consumes a lot of your time. Should be none of your time. Oops. Now, we certainly have a lot of problems in the world. There's no shortage of problems everywhere, right? So I can understand why the kids would question the system. That's a fair question. Why is everything so screwed up if you old timers know so much? That's a fair question, kids. It is. Uh, but part of the answer is because each generation copies the generation before. And it takes something really awful, like the Holocaust, or I mean really tragic, uh, like the slaughter in Rwanda uh, from 20, 25 years ago, or Bosnia. And that, it takes something really horrific a tsunami in life for, for the human race to change. And if religion worked, all the poor people would be better off because they wouldn't be poor, right? So look at the site. And if things were working out, this couldn't happen. A fellow Ivy Leaguer, Princeton, found guilty of murdering his father for his, having his allowance cut. The father took his $1,000 a week allowance away from him, so the kid whacked him. That is wrong on so many levels, I don't know where to start. One, giving him $1,000 a week. Okay. Two, allowing himself to be killed by his own son. Okay. And three, 
this is a hedge fund guy, if I remember the slide correctly. Uh, you know, and um, the, um, it just, you know, it's wrong. But we are where we are. So I can't do anything for what happened to you before you got here today. What I can do is tell you how you can fix it almost instantaneously. Now, 35, I went, uh, I drove by a college today, not this one, and yelled boo. 35 people went to the hospital. 734 needed crisis counseling. 429 needed a safe area room. And classes were canceled for a week. The fact that that slide even makes a little sense is sad to me. It's sad to me. God. Okay. If anyone in this seminar, uh, if, if, if anything in, in my seminar offends you, blame your parents for raising a pussy. Now, I realize that the, the current generation isn't confrontational because you want to be liked. But I would, I would beg the question to ask yourself, are, do you want to be liked for the right reason? Do you want to be liked by the right person? Both of those questions are normally answered by no, no. But it's become politically correct to not offend. I think that's pretty much 100%. But some people need offending. Some people need offending. If somebody had stopped Hitler 80 years ago or 85 years ago, but in those days, the Brits were maybe the forefathers of political correctness and didn't want to be in a war, another war like World War I. It's easy to justify not being aggressive. It's easy to justify not being confrontational. You can always do that, you know. But what I would uh, ask you is think more clearly. Some people need to be confronted. Some people need to be confronted. At six months of age, kids are pretty happy, aren't they? Unless they got a wet diaper. Aren't they? Lag, giggle, yeah, all that bullshit, right? Okay. Three years are still pretty happy. At seven years, remember this is the end of the self-esteem period, still pretty happy. Why did Spartans take their kids away from their parents at seven or eight years old? Because whatever good the mother could do was up to seven or eight, and then they would take them and turn them into warriors. Then what happens, though? You're 15 years, they blame kids going crazy on hormones. I don't think so. What I blame it on is they get away from their parents and the, they see how corrupt and how low of standards and how low the bar is, and they have no role models. Now, these are the American symbols of uh, manhood, according to Life magazine. From G.I. Joe to Pajama Boy in just a few generations. What the? I mean, am I, you know, I, I, how can this happen? Men back in the day, men today. How can this happen? You know? Now, this is a quick testosterone test. We're not going to, put your left hand up, this finger, needs to be longer than your forefinger. You get your testosterone from your mother. It's, it's, it's said that modern medicine says between three and 700 for testosterone is the, the, a good range. High 700, 300, okay. okay. I was asked a couple years ago what my testosterone was, so I get my blood tested every six to eight weeks. I came back to the class and a little Chinese girl and I said, uh, she says, did you bring the paper, Mr. Pena? I said, yes, and I showed it to her. And she goes, she looks up at me, 1,900. One time was a 910. It was my testosterone level. I'm guessing that this average of this room is less than 300. Less than 300. Less than 300. This is a young mentee of mine that's so ashamed of being a snowflake. He goes once a month, he lives in Paris, and there are clubs all around the world. You can find them on the internet. And they beat each other. 
That's not Photoshop. That's for real. They beat each other. You are a product of your social and economic milieu. Most of that social economic milieu is vis-a-vis -vis your parents and sometimes your grandparents. This is not my kid brother who's sitting in the front rows on our challenge because our dad was extremely tough on us. Vince, at my 70th birthday, said words to the effect, if dad had beat me like he beat, my, beat, beat, it, beat my older brother, me, I would have been more successful, etc. Although he's, he's just getting ready to retire himself. <sighs> he's a super high performance guy. He's a civil servant. Um, but our father was chastised. And our father um, would say, well, look at the successful sons I have. And uh, my dad didn't really give a shit what anybody thought. But uh, I wonder where we got it from, you know? Uh, he really didn't give a shit what anybody thought. If you love, if love got the job done, most parents would have produced high performers. It doesn't. 87% of the world is unhappy, according to Gallup poll last year. I think it's higher than that. 87% of the people wake up in the morning unhappy. I told the kids in uh, Nepal, all of you were going to be uh, not as successful as you could be unless you leave Nepal. Because the circle of poverty there is so... Deep. Life expands and contracts with courage through pain. Nobody wants to hear, uh, hear that. But how do athletes get better? Pain, failure, failure, right? Life's no different. Usain Bolt, who I don't know, but one of my mentees was his running partner. Uh, for 11, uh, nine years, 11 months, and one week, he trained the same routine until he expanded and he, th that he vomited at the end of the routine. For the last world championship, he decided to change his routine. I don't know why he would change it after nine years, blah, blah, blah. And he didn't uh, expend as much energy. And he came in third at the world championships in the 100, for those of you who remember. And Gatlin and the other guy uh, came in first and second. But it's through pain. I mean, the football coaches that are the most successful, it's through, you know, uh, pain. Now, of course, now it's not popular to have people pass out in practice. Now it's not popular, God forbid, somebody dies in practice. But this system of pain has worked for a long, long time. This is the, our father who uh, uh, put the pain on us. Looks like a movie star there. He was in the Naval uh, Air Force. Um, but this is not much of an exaggeration what he looked like. This is not much of an exaggeration. Vince and I were afraid of our dad when he was 65. Vince, his friends, his friends were afraid of my dad. My friends were much older, but they, they were still afraid. As, uh, I went to a two-day funeral a couple years ago. I didn't know they had two-day funerals. But, and uh, one of the kids said, and uh, Manny carried a gun. He carried, yeah. And... Um, the, uh, but what did he turn out? What did he turn out? Father was an extraordinary man's man. I am indebted to my father for living, but to my uh, teacher for living well, Alexander the Great. Uh, we are shackled by our dad's sins, uh, or not shackled. When one has not a good father, one must invent and create one. Most of you... Now, don't do this right away, but wait a couple weeks and ask your dad if you were an accident or not. And when the universal, you know the answer. I'm here to tell you more than half, and I don't mean seven years apart or 20, I don't mean that. More than half of you are going to get a positive answer or no answer from your father that whether you were an accident. Do you think, now, some, like, uh, devout Catholics, and sermon, they have 14 kids, and, you know, blah, blah, okay, those, are, those aren't accidents. But 
Do you think they plan on having you turn out the way you've turned out? I hope the fuck not. And there's not a man, woman, or child in this room that can't turn the life around. The oldest, I've been successful at 77 years old. The youngest, 13. That's a pretty big spread. That's a pretty big spread. Albeit it was harder with a 77-year-old. Because there is some truth in an old dog has trouble learning new tricks. That, whoever said that, because it is just harder. Because you've been doing stuff the same way so long, it's tough to break that cycle. Children begin by loving their parents. After a time, they judge them. Rarely, if ever, do they forgive them. You will never look at your parents the same way after tonight. Never. Even those that you think I'm a psycho. Because there, and there's always a lot of truth in what I say. Occasionally, I exaggerate. But people have been thinking about this for thousands of years. Use the site. Take the test. The success tests as a battery only have a 95% success ratio. 95% I can predict by your test scores. Really 99 and a half, but my lawyers tell me I can't say 99 and a half because you'll sue me. So we parrot it down to 95. You take those tests at your own peril. But not, it's not yet. The question's later, kid. Okay, you can always tell the Ivy Leavers, you know. Uh, it is easier to build strong children than to b repair broken men. Wouldn't it have been easier if you had been programmed for success when you were a kid? Hell, yeah, well, you know. Wouldn't it have been easier, for those of you that are athletic, to have uh, been programmed like uh, Tiger Woods or Serena Williams? I know you want to be programmed without the beatings. Uh, Hervando Hollyfield that used to have a saying, uh, uh, my mama had a switch in, back in the, in, in the barn, for, depending on how bad a boy I was. A little switch for a minor infraction, a big switch that looked like a two-by-four for a major infraction. Sigmund Freud, being entirely honest with oneself is a good exercise, which we normally aren't. We are never so defenseless against suffering as when we love. I cannot think of any need in a childhood as strong as the need for a father's protection. And now, they say you can raise, I don't say, the pundits say you can raise kids at one parent, child rearing is as good as two. That's horseshit. Yet you, believe, you listen to it. Most of you have lived lives of giving tacit approval. This guy says something to me, and the three of us are here, and we know this kid's talking shit. And you just, you won't say anything. So occasionally you might even nod, giving him a, a false uh, indication. That's tacit approval. Then he goes to this guy and this gal, and he says, Dan Pena was standing there with this gray-haired guy, and Dan didn't say anything, so it must be true. So then these two... You do it, tacit approval has how you've lived your life because you don't want to be confrontational. You don't want to be like, now some of your cases, you work at places that if, if you don't give tacit approval, you think you're going to get fired. How do you think the society got to that point, though? Not everybody has always been worried about losing their job. Now you're worried about it because you can't get one. Guys, the system's fucked up. Gals, the system's fucked up. And the reason why my demographics have changed from 13 or 15, 13, 15, to 35 is because the kids understand it. The kids understand it. Yes, 25 years I've been doing it. Now, Sally says I have an arthritic back because I've been dragging kids across the goal line for 26 years. There's two Asians and a black man on that thing. Uh, and uh, my biggest error in judgment was thinking that everybody had self-esteem. I, I just somehow, I, I missed that boat somehow, um, and self-confidence. This is really the psychology of the high performer. Go to my site, QLA for Dummies. Notwithstanding, we're sitting here at the University of Pennsylvania, one of the great institutions of higher learning. Go through the steps, read the things I have there, and you'll be a better person if you want to change the world by generating money. 
If you just want to run around emb uh, embassies with placards, I'm not the right guy to, to read or follow. Now, these are the tests. And they only have 95%. Now, I know a lot of you will say, well, I must be the 5% or I'm the half a percent. And you've lived your life that way. But you're not. But you're not. We have some people take these tests 200 times a month or more. But Google Analytics only lists up to 200. We have kids taking the test, doing the same thing over and over, and getting the same results. Einstein said that was insanity. <laughs> the tests are terrific. I wish that I could say they were my test. No, the uh, success test was not my test. Psych psychiatrist from Boston College invented it about 35 years ago. All the other tests are mine. All the other tests are mine. Extinction learning, overcoming fear by positive experiences. If you hang, to the extent that you can find, with an alpha male or a high-performance person, it's going to rub off on you. It's going to rub off on you. What gets measured gets better? Accountability. If you do, do nothing else from this exercise, is make yourself accountable for every hour of the day. Take a list. Say what you do or write down what you do. You'll be sickened. Most, the average of this room, if it's, and it's not, this is not really an average university room, but the average university room spends between 40 and 60% a day on social media. 40 to 60. IBM and a few others have run tests. That's why they block off social media and a lot of uh, on work site. And, uh, and half of the 40 to 60% guys do is porn. At work. When I buy a company and I walk down and everybody's closing their laptops down, they're all fired. <laughs> There's no reason to close your laptop down. Why? What are you hiding? One guy, uh, it's a job application for another place, but you know, once in a while that is, but it's mostly bad stuff like porn. True self-esteem has to be earned. If people don't believe you, if people aren't willing to follow you, it's because they think you're full of shit. And why do they think you're full of shit? Because you've given them no reason not to think you're full of shit. Because they've seen you agree, give tacit approval to crazy people. Now, President Trump, hate him or love him, as I said, it changed the financial world forever. But there was enough of, a, enough of an upheaval, whether he gets reelected or not, I don't know. But there was enough of an upheaval, people were dissatisfied enough as they want to change. Now, the change they got may not be the change they wanted, but they got change, certainly. They certainly got change. And um, so you can rise up above the norms. You can rise up above the political correctness. People that follow me have risen up. Because I've been around 26 years. Some of you older guys in the room are saying, God, I wish I found you 20 years ago. I've been here 26 years. 26 years. You know, they call it quantum leap. I invented that. My quantum leap, and that's the, my best look to be a cholo uh, gangbanger 23 years ago, no, 26 years ago in East LA where my house used to be. My house was between me and that wall with a graffiti. That little, it got torn down as a, uh, because it was turned into a crack house. That was me becoming an officer. And the United States Congress said that I was an officer and a gentleman. I believed them. Whether I'm a gentleman or not uh, is up to question. And then that's when I was uh, inducted by the queen. From Barrio bad guy trying to kill his teacher in the sixth grade to be anointed by the queen of fucking England. Now that's a motherfucking quantum leap. <laughs> I want you to be in the tens of millions and the hundreds of millions and the billions. And it's possible. Only one guarantee in this seminar, as long as you don't give up. As long as you don't give up. Now, uh, the presidents and all these, you know, we know all that. Now, you happen to live in the greatest country economically in the world. That's a big benefit. A lot of the schools I speak at can't say that. 
Who would you rather listen to? Somebody that's read 700 books or done 700 deals? I've done 2,500 transactions. 2,500 transactions. There's not many ways you can get fucked that I haven't been fucked before. So, I mean, they used to say when I was on Wall Street, Pena starts salivating when he sees a Wharton MBA walk in the room, a Harvard MBA walk in the room, because I was going to eat him for lunch. I used to shit, grip off their neck, head and shit down their necks. And it's hard to keep a guy's shoulders in the right posture and crap down his neck <laughs> once you've ripped off his head. It's, it's, it, I've learned I've got strong thigh muscles. I've learned how to do that. <laughs> Again, success leaves clues. Up to 90%. Now, some of the things that can keep you from going out on your own or taking a chance is because you know up to 90% of all startups fail the first year. So it keeps you at your job. Now it works. Come on. OK. Now that was Jeff 20 years ago. Hard to believe. 20 years ago, that was the founder of Amazon. And Amazon's work ethic, 80 hours a week to keep your job, 85 hours a week to be considered for a promotion, 90 hours a week to be promoted. And that's not a company policy. That's uh, imposed by the employees. Because when you're in a successful environment, you want to stay successful. Being honest may not get you many friends, but it will always get you the right ones. John Lennon, who I never met. I don't want to skip for Warren. This is a tweet that Warren wishes he hadn't posted. You will continue to suffer if you have an emotional reaction to everything that is said to you. True power is sitting back and observing things with logic. True power is a restraint. If words control you, that means everyone else can control you. And then he says, breathe a little. I don't know what that means. He's into yoga or some shit. <laughs> the first method of estimating the intelligence of a ruler is to look at the men he surrounds himself with. We said that. Now, Andrew Carnegie, who my model I'm copying, Henry Ford, Rockefeller, Steve, and the current CEO, uh, Cook, who starts business meetings at 4.30 AM, and the head of Amazon, are all animals. We're beasts, savage, cruel. And Mark Zuckerberg, he wishes he could get this comment back. He did in the uh, magazine Vanity Fair a few months ago. You can be unethical and still be legal. That's the way I live my life. What a fucking surprise. <laughs> Why he said that? Because he thinks he's above the law. He thinks we can't touch him. Uh, the collective we, meaning you. I don't give a shit what he does, really. Okay, But for him to say that, it's pretty ballsy. What are they going to do to him? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah, get home and get on your Facebook. I'm blocked from Facebook. I forgot to say that. Seven weeks ago, I got blocked from Facebook. <laughs> Seven weeks. I must be at the peak of my career. <laughs> I'm blocked from Facebook. Uh, and... Uh, the, uh, and of course, our little marketing team was heartbroken. It was like the, you know, the devil had come down and uh, done something to us. But I'm blocked from Facebook, and the, uh, um, it hasn't changed my life any. Uh, although the 35 or 55,000, whatever the amount of people that like you or whatever that word is, uh, we get uh, emails and calls to the office, what happened to Mr. Pena? He appears to be blocked. And uh, is he still alive? Is he, I paid for the seminar. <laughs> The biggest concern they have now is, am I going to live long enough to fulfill the financial obligation I owe them for a seminar in three months? <laughs> Elon, from this great school, he said, we've grown fucking soft. Elon Musk, after Vance noted that only hundreds of people were working at Tesla's headquarters on a Saturday. Uh, you know about PayPal. I don't have to repeat that. He's a notorious workaholic. You know, uh, everybody knows that. 
uh, my mentality is that of a samurai. I would rather commit seppuku than fail. That means kill myself. A pen man? You all look, I mean, I, 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 you all look like uh, deers in the headlight now. Now, I'm go- one of yours. Did he go to this school? Yes. Was he one of your heroes? Yes. Do you know if he's ruthless like fucking Attila the Hun? No, you didn't know that. You don't want to know that. You want to live in a fairy tale, Disneyland environment. All these guys are ruthless and savage. In an interview, he cried about being alone on his birthday. Too bad. Now, Jack Ma, who used to be the flavor of the day, the head of uh, Alibaba, nobody writes about this. He's got the 996 rule. Come to work at 9, don't leave before 9, and work six days a week. That's a lot more hours than you're working. But they don't allow the Chinese to write about it. I believe in some of the things the Chinese do. And only recently, Musk and Gates came out. Uh, I knew this. They, they, they divide their diaries up in five-minute increments. So in one hour, they're doing 12 different things. Most of us can't say hello in five minutes, myself included, believe me. And my methodology, QLA, is not just for making money. This little skinny kid, number one, he came to me two and a half years ago. I want to be the British archery champion, university archery. How many arrows are you firing today? He says, 50 to 100. I said, you, we're going to fire 500 to 700 arrows a day. You're going to put 25 pounds of muscle on, and you've got to be able to pull back a 120-pound bow. He was currently using a 55, 60-pound bow. That's him winning. He, bloody hands. He couldn't get the bow back the first three or four months because he had no muscles. But that's him, first place. You're never going to exceed your highest expectation. But QLA is even better for something else, ladies. That's a, university, a Columbia University professor. I shaved fat off, I shaved fat off her ass with a chainsaw. <laughs> Yum! Mom! Mom! She thinks that I'm God. Her boyfriend and husband think I'm God as well. I'm on Columbia's waiting list to speak. Um, you know, um, maybe when she becomes president of the school, I'll get the opportunity. Yes, I turned eight hundred and twenty dollars into four hundred and fifty million. That is, in today's dollars, uh, twenty one hundred into about uh, 850 million. That's 55 million percent, for those of you that are mathematicians. You've never talked to, met, or heard of anybody that's grown anything at 55 million percent. I can smell success as I can smell death. And with great, gigantic growth like that, there are casualties. But as uh, Fred Smith, the founder of um, um, Federal Express, told me many, many years ago, Dan, he's a contemporary of mine, one year older, he's a Marine officer, I'm an Army officer, he said, when I found out that my successes and failures weren't body bags being sent back to parents from Vietnam, all the decisions I ever made in my life after that were easy. Except, except for the doctors or the doctors that are going to be because they're in med school, None of your decisions are life and death. None. Yet you treat them like life and death. Because your parents, etc., were afraid to make decisions. $50 billion man, teenage, multi-million, 500 million. This is Josh Kim. When he came to me, he had a 15-speed bicycle. It was his total assets. 15 speed. Because this program teaches you the two biggest levers in life are other people and other people's money. And we legitimately, ethically, morally, and legally use commercial debt to buy businesses. And there's Josh. And this was his roommate at the castle. At Krakow University, I, I, he gave the example, a young man had made a million one hundred thousand euros that year as a student at this very university. 
And I said, Jan, do you mind if I, you stand up? He stood up. Not one single student went over and talked to him. Not one single student went and asked him how he made the million euros as an active, full-time student. Because if he told them, then would, that would apply ex excessive, or in your minds, excessive pressure on you because now you know, and if you don't do it, you've got nobody to blame but yourself. A lot of people pretend to want to be successful, but very few are willing to pay the price. This is just, uh, these are just young kids, came to me at 17. These kids came to me uh, at 13 and 14. They're worth, I don't know, 68, 70 million each now. They're in their early 20s. Do they look cocky? Yes. Do they give a shit what you say or think about them? No. Are they happy as shit? Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, that's okay. There's another kid flying around in his plane. Came to me as an auto mechanic. There's Josh again. Oh, this is the island Josh wants to buy. And that's his house he's going to build. He just had his 22nd birthday. Now, for the man, we all know what you were doing at 17, 18, 19. Remember that porn I talked about? He's now 21, or 22. He just turned 22 last week. He's Asian, doesn't look Asian, and he looks 15 years old. He thinks he looks 20. Sally and I have had the privilege of meeting his parents and his nine brothers and sisters. They're Bible thumpers. Bible thumpers. I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but their whole life evolves around, is it evolve or evolve? But anyway, it goes around God and doing good shit, which is not my model. So he's he took the Bible thumper model and he kind of melted it into the QLA model. And he's rich. And he's 22. 22. He's a good kid. Largest deal, we know that. That's my mentee that made the deal. The Saudis. Another mentee that came to me. He was a pizza, he was a pizza man. Who now makes motion, motion pictures with Robert Duvall, Ed Harris. Uh, he's the third largest uh, holder, uh, owner of hospitals. And uh, Hungary came to me. He uh, made 30,000 euros a year, cried. He says, I can't do it in this country because there's too much corruption. He's now rich. Uh, this is a current day university student in uh, England who's doing it while he's a student. Uh, he's sitting in a Rolls. For those of you that don't know what a backseat of a Rolls looks like, uh, yes, I have done 775 million. No, now, the good news for me is there's no compression algorithm for experience. You can't write a code for the thousands of deals I've been in. Now someday maybe you'll be able to write a code. But for today, no money, I'm the only game in town, and it's free on my website. Free. But freedom isn't free, which I posted yesterday. Freedom is not free. But my stuff is free. For those of you vets, I thank you again, but freedom isn't free. We don't have to make every mistake ourselves. We know that high performance. We talked about that. Now, in this uh, uh, institution of higher learning, we have a lot of thinkers. But normally, it's not uh, commensurate with the doer. When I was asked at Harvard uh, many years ago, uh, Mr. Pena, what would you consider your success based on? Balls and brains. Balls versus brains. I snapped back 50-50. Now I say 90-10, 90, 90 balls, 10% brains. You see, most of you would be embarrassed to say that because it would d uh, demean or make uh, uh, fun of your intellectual capacity. Whoever fucking taught you that, what were they smoking? Maybe your parents were doing drugs you just didn't know. I'm results-oriented. So is the world. And for those of you that think that life is a journey, you are sick. Life is not a journey. Life is a process. You find somebody that is where you want to be, 
5, 10, 20 years from now, and then mimic him, copy him, model him. Mentoring is what it's about. That's Dan Locke, perhaps my most successful Asian mentee. I'm reminded he's Asian by you guys, because I, I, I just look, I don't, I don't see color or anything, but I just spoke at his, his uh, worldwide conference in Vancouver. Uh, and he came to me when he was 21, poor. We know Bill Gates has a mentor. It's still uh, Warren Buffett. Now, the good news is Warren, Elon, Zuckerberg, and Gates are all introverts, which means you all qualify. Nothing to be ashamed about being an introvert. Most of the planet is. There is something to be ashamed now that you've been told it's OK to be an introvert, and then you not pull the trigger. There is something wrong with that, in my judgment. Mentoring's been around a long time. Aristotle, Plato, Socrates. I've had the privilege of mentoring active duty Army, Navy, Marines, and Air Force. I spoke at the Naval Academy uh, in the last year, a big privilege of mine. And when the Navy SEALs, Green Beret, Special Ops people were uh, uh, transitioning out of the military, as I alluded to at the beginning of the talk uh, about a year ago, who did they ask to talk to them? Me. Not because I've seen combat, because I haven't. But I'm one of the few that went from the military to super success, not overnight, but almost overnight. Because nobody told me it was going to be hard. I didn't know it was going to be hard. Hence, it wasn't hard. If I had been inundated, now they have uh, uh, programs when you get out of the Army, Navy, where they tell you, and they don't tell you it's going to be easy. And you take these classes, the, uh, how to get along with civilians. Uh, well, fuck that. I mean, I didn't have any of those. All I knew is I got to go out there and I got to make a living. The only thing, the good, the two things that I use, the, uh, my government benefits, the GI Bill to go to school. I never used the GI Bill to buy a house because the houses I bought were always so much over the limit of the GI Bills to buy a home that I never used them. But it did pay for my education. Not an education like this, but I wasn't told it was supposed to be impossible, hence I wasn't. But when I talked to these guys, it was my privilege, I told them that they should be able to, you can't equate being able to SEAL Team 6 somebody and make a million dollars. There's two different. You have an emotional bank account and a financial bank account. Most people worry about the financial bank account. It's your emotional bank account that helps you when you're up against the wall. Your emotional bank account. But they're, they're not asking me back for next year. They said I was too harsh. <laughs> and a Marine, a jarhead, who stole my license plate in Arizona, which we're going to get. Pardon? Well, congratulations. OK. Uh, did you come from Arizona? Okay, very good. I'm glad to see you. Okay. But I couldn't get the goddamn license plate, so I'm jealous. <laughs> um, now, interest rates are at the lowest in 5,000 years. They're giving away money, kids. And I want you to get used to this. Is your new and who's on the bill? Well, am I a fucking wizard or what? I mean, <laughs> who's on the bill? Who's on the bill? God love him. But he was kind of an ugly fucker, you know? It just. It... <laughs> and I want you, instead of snorting that cocaine, this is what I want you to snort. <laughs> just like that. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. Now, you've been told all your life, money is dirty, money is the root of all evil, money is not important, money makes you a bad person, money blinds you from truth. Money, uh, the only thing blinding me from truth was a bad tequila once. But anyway, uh, money makes you greedy. Other values are more important. And this is, everybody in this room has heard at least one of these. Now, we didn't have any money. Now, this is a slight exaggeration, Vince. We were so poor, we had a possum for a dog. Now, that's not true. But I mean, when I'm down in Texas, Alabama, Arkansas, that's what I say. And they all go, oh, uh. um, But we didn't have any money, so we didn't talk about it. And by the time he came along, many years later, uh, the um, dad was in better financial shape, 
But he still didn't have any, any money. Uh, uh, his friends, and I don't even know if you know that, they used to call him Pension Pena. He used to like to collect pensions. He had a federal pension, then he got a school pension, then he got an LAPD pension, he got a military pension, because he wanted the security of pensions. Security, as many of your parents, maybe some of the people in the room. Whoops. Now, if these aren't the kind of guys you're hanging with, you're hanging in the wrong group, those people on the same mission, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. We know that. Association is power. You hang out with monkeys, your life becomes a circus. I don't like when you laugh like that. Okay. <laughs> success, is being, uh, success is like being pregnant. Everyone says congratulations, but nobody knows how many times you got fucked. You're born limitless. You have limiting beliefs. Releasing, not gaining, emotional baggage. What learned can be unlearned. Stay aware of limiting beliefs of others. Get in touch with your emotions. Get mentors. Man, what the fuck happened? <laughs> That's Cary Grant, a British guy. Now, this is what I thought I was going to see on campus. I haven't seen anybody even remotely close to that. But we're protesting because Donald Trump is not mentally stable. <laughs> what? Wrong way. Oh, I can't get a job because Trump is a racist. Is that why you can't get a job? As Pope John Paul, I'd like to say he told me this, but he didn't. He said it. It's all in your hands now, Latin totus tuis. This is the end of my talk, but the new start of your life. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, my name is David. I'm uh, from. Also, add your age. My name, age, where you're from, and then the question. Please. My name is David. My age is 24. And I'm from New Jersey, New York, the border somewhere. Okay. Uh, my, uh, my question, you say, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. You also say to join clubs that you can't afford. Correct. My question to you is, what are your favorite uh, private social clubs? Uh, it depends where you live. Um, the, um, the New York Athletic Club used to be a club that was worth joining. Uh, but I mean, uh, the Harvard Club, the Cornell Club in New York City, uh, I, I don't know if Penn has those kind of clubs, uh, but um, the, um, in my part of the world, the Jonathan Club, the California Club in Los Angeles, uh, in Vancouver, the Vancouver Club, um, uh, there are clubs that, um, that you're going to be uh, associated with high-performance people. And there's two committees that you should get on when you join the club. First of all, if you're less than 30, they get a special rate. Give you 10, 20 years to pay. If you're less than 35, if you're less than 40, for those of you guys that are over 40 or 50, they don't give you any special rate. You, just, you gotta pay to join. But you wanna join the finance committee and the membership committee. Not the Christmas party committee, not the golf committee, finance and Christmas, oh, excuse me, finance and uh, uh, membership, because you're gonna be able to view who's joining. And you'll be able to cherry pick somebody that you want to introduce yourself to. And most of the high performance people that I've been privileged to be around, I went up and knocked on their door, with a couple of uh, exceptions, and say, my, my name's Dan Pena, uh, uh, can, I, can I buy you lunch? Or now you don't need to buy you a cup of coffee, okay? Uh, and I've been around some pretty good guys. But it's the clubs that you can't afford. I also say join Rotary. I also say join um, Toastmaster, yeah, Toastmaster. Uh, and when you join Toastmaster, because most of you can't sell a piece of ass in a lumber camp, because you, your communication skills are so poor. Because now, especially the current generation and a half, have grown up on a computer. And you even text things to people. You know, I mean, that's, uh, I can't believe that. I mean, uh, business decisions. So you want to be able to speak. So when you join uh, Toastmasters, you want to be in the front row where you're competing uh, and you're actually giving presentations, not in the viewing row back in the bleachers. Thank you for all the free content on your website. Thank, thank you. Good evening, sir. Uh, Christopher Owens, 34, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, during the roll-up phase, um, 
My question is more so concerned with the acquisitions. Okay. The financing, uh, do you go back to the same institution that, that lends you the financing for that? No, no. well, when you buy a company uh, and you follow the model, first, uh, first most important thing is a motivated seller. And then the motivated seller helps you structure the deal around commercial lending, meaning regular banks. Uh, but if they have their own debt structure, if they have a strong banking relationship, one, one of the three or four banks you, you interview, and remember, you're interviewing the financial institutions. And there's, there's, this is on my site. Uh, the board, uh, we have taken the decision to review all our professional relationships, including banking. Currently, we have a deposit relationship, meaning we deposit money and we may or may not get service. This is all on the site, okay? Uh, and so one of the banks that you will consider to do the deal with is his, his or her own bank because you don't have to reinvent the wheel if it's the bank of the acquisition candidate. They already know the business because they've been banking them three, five, seven, ten years. Hello, Mr. Peña. Uh, my name is Ian. I'm from Puerto Rico, living in New York City. It's an honor to share the same room with you tonight. Thank you. I have a simple question for you. You've said countless times, including tonight, that you've never met a person who's a high-performance person who's part-time. Correct. Um, I'm currently working a 60-hour-a-week corporate job that basically allows me to live paycheck to paycheck. I guess you could say I'm sucking on the tailpipe and I'm addicted. So in, uh, to what extent, if at all, do you think it's possible to do QLA part-time? I, I, let me cut you short. It is. 75% uh, of the people that come to me, either directly or indirectly, on the site or in the seminar, have got another job. <coughs> or they're going to school full-time. Uh, or they're in the military full-time. Okay, and so they're practicing QLA in addition to, to those uh, um, job requirements. I realize that, you know, uh, while I don't like backup plans, uh, your family uh, is only going to go so long without you feeding them. And so you've got to put food on the table. So Josh Kim worked 60 hour a week, hour a week as a uh, programmer while he was doing his first two acquisitions. He was working 60 hours a week at a job, and he was working 60 hours a week in QLA, 120 hours a week. So yes, you can do it. It, 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 it takes uh, uh, real good management skills. Women are better multitaskers. The women that work and do this are better at it, because somehow, I don't know if it's because a baby falls out between their legs. I don't know what the reason is, but they, are, they, they seem to handle more things at once than just you know, one thing. So the answer is yes, you can continue your job and continue QLA. Focus. Thank you, sir. Okay. Hey, Mr. Pena. Uh, my name is Sam. I'm 20 from Toronto. So what's it called? I recently found out about you three weeks ago, and I jumped into it, started building my board and everything. And uh, the industry that I'm looking into is dental practices because that's... It's hot. Yeah. Healthcare is hot, hot, hot. And I was... So my question is, I was talking to my industry. And banks, the best credits on the planet are dentists. The second best credits on the planet are veterinaries. The third best uh, uh, um, credits, meaning they pay the, back, uh, pay the money back, are escort services. <laughs> Hookers. Okay, go ahead. And uh, I was talking to my industry expert, and he said that in order for you to make an acquisition, acquisition in in this market, you need a dental, like a dentist as a principal. Okay, you've so, got to find out which, uh, uh, which part of Canada you are. Uh, uh, some parts of the world, the, uh, there, there has to be 50% dentist. Some parts of the world, you only need one dentist yeah. if he uh, has uh, some ownership. It depends on each, each location. Yeah, so my question is, is it still worth it to give a dentist like 35 to 50 percent? No, you're not giving them 35 bullshit. You're not giving them, you're not giving them cock. That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> you, you know, you're giving them 2 to 3 to 4 percent. That's it. To Unless he happens money. to be your chairman, and then my formula says you give him 10 to 20 percent. Okay. But uh, the, um, no, no. And that industry expert, you got to slap him around a little. Okay. Yeah. Got it. And it's hard for a kid to slap, I don't mean physically. Now, I meant physically when I did it. But it's hard for a 20-year-old to, to talk back or up to a 40 or 50 or 60 year old. That's just, because that's how you were raised, you know? Uh, and you, you got this, you know, leadership starts at the beginning. The board governs, you lead. 
It's really important. The board of directors, the dream team as we call them, govern, corporate governance, etc. But you're the leader. Josh was slapping, the, not physically, he was pushing these guys around when he's 17, 18, 19. You saw what he looks like. He looks 15. You can do it. His only claim to fame, other than the 15-speed bike, he was an Eagle Scout. And his father is a West Point graduate, a senior Army officer. And his mother is a psychologist who uh, read uh, the book... Um, by Spock. So a few things fell in his favor. He understood discipline. He kind of understood leadership. And his mother uh, raised him by that book that I uh, say is the Bible. But yes, you, I, I answered your question about Dennis. Thank you so much. God bless okay. you. And dental practices have 20, 30% margin. Yeah. Yeah. Gross margin. And why do I want you to have 20, 30% gross margin? Because very few people in this room could manage their way out of a wet paper bag. And I want bigger margins so you have more uh, uh, wiggle room if you fuck up something. Okay, go ahead. Hi, my name is Seth Donnelly. Um, thank you a lot for your talk. I'm from West Grove, Pennsylvania, which is about an hour outside Philly, and I'm currently studying biotechnology and business. Now, game. you sound like you're 40 years old, but you look like you're 10. How old are you? <laughs> I get that a lot, unfortunately. I'm hoping to look 15. You're 15. I'm 18. 18, okay, well, you, you remind me of Josh. Josh didn't have that long of blonde hair, but anyway, go ahead. So I'm studying biotechnology and business management at Penn State. Over the past few years, um, I've been figuring out that what I'd like to do in my life is change the way the biotech industry operates and allow um, people who don't have a specialized professional scientific background to participate in okay, research. Okay, what's your question? What would you say is the best strategy to approach that because before I discovered the acquisition-based strategy, I was more into some people who went from the bottom up and were looking at okay, building bottom, it all from well, themselves. Well, uh, bottom up, you'll be 50 years old before you're... Okay. You think so? No, no I, I don't think so, I know so. And uh, the, um, it's easier to buy revenue than uh, uh, create revenue from the bottom. Now, I'm gonna tell you something that's not part of the seminar, but the, uh, you, uh, I'm being sarcastic now, you an Ivy League school, so maybe you're uh, bright enough to get this. When you buy a business, first of all, anybody that started a business, the first 50,000 or 500,000 from zero is geometric growth. From zero, right? So for those of you that had a business. Now, when you buy a business that's got a million dollars in revenue, I'm using a small number, and you take it to a bank, the bank knows when you say, this is de-risk revenue, Meaning, you don't know how much the person that fo the founder of that business spent to create that first million dollars. You're not paying him for the five million that he started as a startup to do the one million. The banks intellectually understand, oh, it's de-risked because you're buying the top line revenue. And when you also use the other, this is the other thing that's on my side, is that we will never bring you a deal that doesn't pencil. Free cash flow will always cover debt service. All of a sudden, you're in a different league. Most of you in this room wouldn't know a good deal if it bit you in the ass. And when you say that to the banks, all of a sudden, you're a player. You're not a contender anymore. So to the extent that you can find businesses that already have existing cash flow, the answer is terrific. And you're, you're, buying, you're, not, you're not buying turnaround situations. The weakest link in the QLA formula is you. And you're building up like a sandcastle, your industry experts, your CEO, your CFO, your chairman, uh, your big accounting firm, and your big law firm. But you're the weak link. Yet at the end of the first deal, you're going to have 60, 70% of the deal. So remember, D, you've already de-risked the revenue. It's really important. And people, you know, we have 30-some gigs of uh, free information. And that's not counting all the YouTube shit. I don't mean, it's not shit, but all the YouTube stuff. You, ha you have about 100 gigs. If you go through, two, two, two guarantees. If you go through all 100 gigs, you'll be um, 10, worth $10 million in 18 months. If you make 2,000 cold calls, 
you'll be worth uh, $10 million in six months. A cold call meaning you talk to a decision maker, an owner, not a fucking flabby chitted secretary, uh, not a receptionist, you don't leave a fucking message, you talk to a decision maker, 2,000 cold calls and you'll be rich. Guaranteed. But you won't make 20 calls. Josh Kim made 300 calls a fucking day. It's not by accident the little skinny shit teenager in his fucking jet plane. Thank you. Again, only questions, no statements. You don't need to say good evening. Actually, he hates when you say that. So don't say that. And just a question, your name no, no, and your I age. No, no, I hate good morning for my military expense. What's good about it, Pina? You sorry Mexican piece of shit. You're the sorriest excuse of a, a soldier in this man's army. You like my wife, Pina? No, you don't like my wife, Pina? Why don't you? And when I became an officer, young officer, 20-year-old, you're supposed to salute officers, enlisted men. And um, the, they used to say, Pina, the uh, master sergeant or the sergeant major, Pina, there's a rumor here that you don't like uh, uh, Corporal Harold's wife. Now, how do you answer that? <laughs> anyway, I don't like good morning because I get uh, twitches. Go ahead now. My name is Aviv Gigi. I'm 20 years old. Um, given that you're going to be next Prime Minister of Great Britain and you don't have Castle Seminars planned for um, 2020, are you accepting any mentees in the no. short term? I am having a, sem a seminar January 18th in London, a one-day, uh, uh, nine-hour deal uh, to uh, quell the uh, demand, if you will. Um, the... Um, but in, 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 I'm a, f a f transparent guy. I have three, book de three documentary deals on the table, two book deals on the table, one TV show on the table, uh, and uh, I want to be available if called to serve in the next ad admin by Trump. And I will be the ambassador without portfolio. I will ne never get by a congressional investigation. It has to be appointment. And I will be the hatchet man to do the shit the president can't do as president. I will clean fucking Washington up. I will give it the goddamn enema that it should have had 50 years ago. OK, go ahead. My name is Daniel Gigi. I'm 16 years old, and I'm currently a dual enrolled student. Did you student. say 1-5? 16. 16. And okay. I'm a dual enrolled student in Virginia. Uh, my question is, what are the three most critical uh, habits or attributes to cultivate in oneself to put yourself on the track for high performance success? Andrew Carnegie had four rules of success. Financial motive must prevail. Financial motive must prevail. Financial motive must prevail. Financial motive must prevail. So one is financial motive must prevail. OK. The second thing is laser beam focus. And in my judgment, the third, from my experience with all the, the big hitters that I've been privileged to be around, is um, uh, being obsessed. Because being obsessed, OCD is, is more than laser beam focus. Being obsessed is being sick. And I am, still at 74, pretty fucking sick. And, uh, I, but I, the, my challenge is I have to live vicariously through you now. So I'm doing what your parents fucked up, but you, you're, so, you're slow. I'm, I'm asked if you started on uh, uh, the 1st of uh, September or whatever month you want to do, how long would it take me to do all the things that I tell you that takes three to seven years? 30 to 45 days. 45 days if I fucked everything up. We have guys doing it now in 45, 60, 75 days, and they can't find their ass with both hands tied behind them. But they're making the calls, and they're, you know, they're, all the stuff's on the website. And the webinars are, uh, the, uh, the YouTube, I call them webinars. The YouTube stuff is golden. 
is golden. And I don't get paid for my YouTube. I do it for free. I don't uh, advertise what's the right, whatever the right word is. So I, yeah, I, so I don't get any money. Yeah, I don't do that. Because uh, I don't want somebody's ugly message in the middle of my goddamn YouTube. <laughs> Some dipshit that, you know, hasn't made any money. Most of the guys have made their money by putting asses on seminar seats and selling product. Product including books. Okay. We got time for one more. Okay. Uh, Mr. Pena, I'm a screenwriter. I've put in 20, 30 hour days. I've written over 100 screenplays. Uh, with your expertise in the entertainment business, besides maybe not getting back into it, because I'm going to do it anyway, what is the one thing you would focus on, one you, you, action you would take? You, you need an influencer like uh, Denzel Washington or uh, somebody that has been super successful. you got to sell him or her to believe in your idea, uh, which isn't easy. Now, speaking of Hollywood, this is very much like business. 25,000 kids come to Hollywood every year, brand new, with stars in their eyes from Kansas or New Jersey. One person makes it. Business. I'm here to tell you, 250,000 kids start businesses every year in America. One makes it to the big time, meaning billions, like a Zuckerberg. Maybe nine make it to what I would call the second league. You'd call it the first league, but I'd call it the second league. Because they're trying to, uh, to do deals that aren't real deals. The, the beauty of the QLA model, notwithstanding the simplicity, is that you don't need anything other than somebody that wants to sell as much as you want to buy. The ideal customer, ideal uh, um, person, they tease me in the industry. A motivated seller to Pena is the wife just had a stroke and is in a wheelchair, and the husband is spitting up blood from an emphysema. Now, that's a goddamn motivated seller. Now, see, you don't know that there are millions of motivated sellers like that because you've never looked. When you go and offer your board free founder's equity, that's free equity in the Foundy Nuco company, they will, they will be all over you like a cheap suit. Because they've worked for all these big companies. LinkedIn is the best sales tool that was ever invented for this program. LinkedIn. Because all the two or five or seven million people on LinkedIn have one thing in common. They want to make money. And they work for, and you want people that are about to retire or already recently retired. And they can't make ends meet. Very few people can make ends meet, meaning they live paycheck to paycheck. Is that still a term you use? They live paycheck to paycheck, hand to mouth. They live hand to mouth. And you wouldn't be surprised. How, how, and I wasn't Josh Kim's uh, chairman, although he, he did ask me, but I, I, I wanted him to do it because I, I could see talent. But when a 17, 18, 19 year old kid asked a 65 year old former managing partner for the Southwestern United States for the healthcare for PWC, to be the chairman, why would they, that 64-year-old guy even listen to him? Because he's got no fucking money. Because he's one step above broke more than you. And that's a tragedy. Because the system doesn't work anymore. It just bloody doesn't work. If it worked, all you kids wouldn't be here. Now, when people come to me, I'm the last saloon in the last town on the edge of the earth, and the earth is flat. You've tried everything known to man, and it didn't work. Nobody tells you you're 2,000 cold calls away from being rich because all the guys that you know their names don't want to tell you that. But we got this $69 a quarter program, and we got this and that. My sales training was calling everybody in the white pages in Manhattan. Everybody! A lot of people in Manhattan. In those days, about 9 million. And by the time I went through the white pages, I was making 50, 60 grand. Now, this is in the early 70s. 50, 60, 70 grand a month. Not a lot of money, but my 70 was, did all right. And then my sales manager, Bob, oh, you went through that, kid. Here's the yellow pages. Call every cocksucker in the yellow pages. 
By the time I was through that, I was making 100, 150, 200 grand a month. 1974, 75, 76. Not a lot of money. I know Trump changed you guys. I had two drivers, two rolls, um, uh, uh, rolls uh, extended. Uh, well, I'm 27 years old. But it's all when we reverse engineered how I made all my money and we put it in a seminar and now online, it's all there. It's all there. And it's free. And as some of the guys used to say, if it's free, it's for me. Now, kids, I enjoy this a lot. You've been a great group. Uh, my wife has given me a dirty look, like she thinks I'm going to drop over from a stroke here because um, I'm old. But uh, the, uh, thank you very much, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.